Good morning. At this time of the year, the board considers those issues that are related to boundary changes and the capital improvements program. Today, we will review the proposed spring amendment timeline, boundary studies, and discuss project timelines and scope of work. If alternatives or modifications are offered today to the interim superintendent's recommendations to boundary scopes or project budgets that board members wish to modify, it would be helpful for affected communities to know about these potential changes prior to the public hearings. Therefore, as a reminder to my colleagues, today is the final day to identify any alternative or modification. If there is a second, a vote will be taken after a brief discussion of the alternative or modification. Five votes are required in order to place the alternative or modification before the public for comment, along with the interim superintendent's recommendation. If the alternative or modification is adopted by the board, staff will notify the affected community so they may testify to the interim superintendent's recommendation and the alternative or modification by March 14th, by the March 14th hearing. Please keep in mind that a vote to place an alternative or modification before the board does not commit board members to support the change when final action is taken, nor does it preclude the board from making any changes to the CIP when it takes final action. Again, the board is scheduled to take final action on these matters on March 19th, 2024. Before we get started, I'd like to give my colleagues a moment to introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Saeed. Hello, everybody. Sammy Saeed, student member of the board. And as always, I'm super excited to be here today. Oh, good morning, everyone. Shebra Evans, District 4. Good morning, everybody. Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. And I want to wish my colleague, uh, Grace, a happy birthday. Oh. And good morning, Brenda Wolf, District 5. Happy birthday. Good morning, Julie Yang, District 3. Happy birthday. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the uh, wonderful birth wishes. I'm sorry I couldn't be in person. Grace Rivera Oven, uh, representing District 1. Okay. And Ms. Harris is here as well. Um, Dr. Felder, do you have any open, opening comments? I too would like to say good morning to everyone and happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, given that this portion of the present, oh, okay, so uh, with that, with that we can uh, begin with our presentation for today. All right, so again, good morning, um, President Silvestri and members of the Board of Education. Today, we will have a follow-up discussion on the two topics that were discussed during the previous presentation on February 27, uh, 2024. Uh, two boundary study uh, scope recommendations and project timelines and scopes of work for some of our capital uh, projects. Today's presentation will include additional information related uh, to my recommendation for the two boundary study scopes and will provide board members with an opportunity to ask any additional questions before this, um, this afternoon's um, or this morning's uh, public uh, hearing. We uh, also will provide information on specific capital project timelines and scopes. Um, and so I will ask um, Mr. Seth Adams, Associate Superintendent of Facilities, to introduce his team and to begin the presentation. Uh, Mr. Adams. Thank you, Dr. Felder, and thank you, uh, President Silvestri and members of the board. Here with me today is uh, Ms. Adrian Karamias, who will, will help walk through the, the, the elements around the boundary study scope. Um, as, as we mentioned before, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into it today. We're going to talk about middle schools. We're going to show uh, some of the effects tables from the Capital Improvements Program. Uh, just give a, a, a little bit bigger overall picture of uh, the superintendent's recommendation. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, so we'll, we'll go through that element of the boundary studies, and then we're going to dive into uh, the project timelines and scope of work. The last meeting, we spent quite a bit of time talking about several of our high school projects, some of the limitations that we're seeing around budget. Um, today we're going to continue the, the conversation around some of those projects. We will talk 
um, about Damascus High School. Uh, I know we've received quite a bit of uh, feedback around the programmatic piece, uh, the automotive program at Damascus, so talk a bit about that. And then address Poolsville High School. You know, as we've uh, continued to work through that project, we're entering phase two, and we need to just talk about, provide some updates to the board around um, the schedule of that particular project. So with that, if we go to the next slide. Um, this, again, is uh, uh, the, the timeline of the calendar. Um, you know, we have the second work session today. We have our first public hearing this evening. Um, as, as we mentioned before, the public hearing this evening is, is focused mostly on the projects. Um, we, we're asking those to come out and talk about um, the projects that we presented around scope, around um, you know, some of the approaches that we are taking from, from a, a school district perspective, uh, but it's not uh, to address the non-recommended reductions. Again, that's, that's a process that's separate and that goes through the county council. Uh, but for tonight, that is focused on, you know, the scope of work that we, inter we introduced at the last meeting. Uh, the 14th um, public hearing, you know, we're, we're looking to focus that on the, scopes, uh, the scope of work of the two boundary studies. Um, and then obviously on March 19th, that will be the board action and any dialogue that, uh, that may come from uh, the, uh, the public hearings um, that we, we hear tonight and on the 14th. So with that, we'll transition to the next slide. I will turn it over to Ms. Karamias to, to walk us through the boundary studies. Good morning. So these, some of these slides you already saw from our first um, board work session, but just to review, uh, the, if you look at the map, these are the areas that we, were, we are focused on. So the green is the Woodward Boundary Study. If you recall, that one was already approved, but we were coming back because we needed to revise the timeline based on the delay of the project. The uh, clusters that are in sort of that orangey color, those are the schools that were identified um, when we started with Crown High School and we first put it into the CIP. And then the two clusters that are in yellow are Damascus and Clarksburg. That is uh, associated with the Damascus High School major capital project. And part of that is an expansion to relieve the overutilization at Clarksburg High School. So next slide, please. So um, again, this is for the reopening of Charles uh, Woodward High School. Those are all the clusters that are included in that approved boundary study. You can see what the approved at that time, uh, the approved timeline was, with you can, and you can see that it was supposed to start actually right now. Um, but because it was delayed, we are now looking to uh, realign that timeline based upon the completion date for the reopening of Woodward High School. So the superintendent, the interim superintendent, did make a recommendation to uh, revise that timeline. There were no changes to the scope of the boundary study, meaning there are only high schools and middle schools that were associated with the boundary study, no uh, changes to the elementary schools. Can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. Why are we delaying it based on the delay of the construction? I mean, we've already started and have some stuff approved, and why not just keep going? So, so um, at More this point, so at this point, we're already sort of late in the in the process. We're actually, if if we look at that timeline, we'd already be delayed because mm -hmm. we were supposed to start it in the spring, which is right now. We haven't had a board approval yet. We haven't um, put out the RFP yet, so we're sort of already late in that process. Um, we, the students would not be able to be reassigned to Woodward until 2027. We always talk about doing a boundary study. Um, we want to be close enough that we have as much data, information, enrollment projections as possible. Um, with this schedule and even with the revised schedule, there will be a whole year to be able to engage communities to, yeah, it's not going to be approved in November and then the school opens the following August. It is a whole year. We plan on doing it in the spring and then there will be a whole year opportunity for principals to engage their new students, have, I know when we talked about Clarksburg, Northwest and Seneca, they had like picnics, like open, you know, to allow kids to come and meet the school, walk through the school, meet the administration. So there will be a whole year, even with the revised schedule, to be able to do that. And the same thing with Crown. And, and 
And to just further elaborate, you know, one of the, the reasons, too, that we're recommending a delay is that a two-year window in between a decision and then ultimately when implementation happens, we feel that's going to be a bit challenging just from a community. You know, so a year gives ample time to, as, a, as Ms. Carabin has talked about, really set up some of those community building um, events. Uh, but two years in advance uh, just, just seems like there won't be as much you know, involvement or urgency. So the idea of having about a year to do those processes makes more sense uh, than having a two-year window. So you can see this is actually the revised one. I pulled out the the old one. So this is the revi the recommended one now with the revised timeline. So as you can see, if you just look at the last bullet, the late February, March, it's this time frame in 2026. The school doesn't open until August of 2027. So you actually have a year and a couple of months even to engage the community, to get parents acclimated if they are reassigned. So there is ample time. Usually it's a November and then it's an August. So it's a six month. So this gives you more than enough time. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. So this is, before we slip to the next slide, because I was sort of ahead of myself, this is the revised schedule. So again, if you look at it, it's spring 2024, which is now. We will start that request for a proposal. The board will approve it this summer. We will start engaging whoever is hired, whoever consultants are, in, are, are hired. In early 2025, we will start that boundary study process, anticipating it will probably go the whole year, not school year, calendar year of 2025 with an early, um, with a, the report released in January, and then uh, the superintendent making a recommendation in early February to allow, again, for time for community to respond to that recommendation. And then the board will go through their process of work session, public hearing, action, which will lead you into sort of that March time frame, and then again, allowing over a year for community um, engagement with their potentially new school assignments. Okay. Next slide. So um, as Mr. Adams said, all we wanted to do here is give you an opportunity to look, and I know it's always difficult looking at, at the numbers, but just a general sort of where we are with the schools. You can see a number of the schools are overutilized, which of, of course, that's the reason why we are looking to reopen Woodward. I'm just going to put on my glasses so that I can see. Um, you can see um, church, um, sorry, wrong, again, ahead of myself. Um, so the first, we could see Blair has a little bit of space, uh, I'm sorry, Bethesda Chevy Chase has a little bit of space in the last year of the six-year CIP. You can see Blair is over is overutilized by almost 600 kids, Einstein overutilized by almost 450 students, um, Kennedy has very little space, Northwood, you could see that's where Northwood's expansion is, it's showing about 500 seats available, and remember, it doesn't account for students moving in because, of course, there's no boundary study. So this is the space that will be available for the boundary reassignment. Um, Wheaton, you can see, is over by almost 500 kids, and Walter Johnson by almost 700 students. So, And we always look at the last year of the six-year CIP. So in response to that, again, having as much current data that we can have to use for the boundary study is also a helpful um, you know, helpful as part of the process. Um, so again, you could see approximately, if you look at the bullets to the right, there's approximately an overutilization of almost 2,200 students. There's about 2,900 available with all of those students, with all of those uh, schools enrollment and compared to capacity. Um, that available, that little extra flexible space is actually a good thing when we're talking about the consortium to allow those students, if that's their first choice, to just give a little bit of flexibility as they move uh, throughout the consortium. So those are the sort of the data behind it. If you go to the next slide, 
this is the visual of it. Um, and I think the visual is probably a little bit more helpful. You can see uh, the, the clusters that are in green, the way it works is that the green shows the available space and as you go up into the blue, it shows the overutilization. So you can see that there's, a, again, a little bit of space um, in uh, Whitman and in BCC, but then you can see where there is overutilization at the clusters that I, that I spoke about. And then this would be all part of the, that boundary study for reopening of Woodward. Okay, the next slide, because middle schools are included in the boundary study as well, remember no elementary schools, but middle schools and high schools based upon the interim superintendent's recommendation. Again, you can see um, you know, where there is capacity, uh, where there, some of the schools are sort of at capacity and when there's a little bit of room. There's only really one school there that, has a, um, that, is, that is overutilized. There is either a little bit of space or at capacity. And again, allowing when, when we're doing a boundary study, having a little bit of flexibility um, in, in reassigning students helps when there is a little bit of space. If there are no questions, we can just go on to then. I can't see the, what are the, what's the white? What cluster that is? Loiterman. Um, that's Loiterman. And the other yeah. two light or leather? Are um, Silver Spring International and North Bethesda are sort of the two, uh, the three lighter ones. And North Bethesda had an addition recently. Oh, a while ago. Um, and the, the um, Silver Spring International that, so just to clarify, this is this school year. What the data that you were looking at, of course, is our six year effects tables. This is this school year. So um, there's just a little bit of room there. North Bethesda did have an addition, but it was a, a little while ago. Um, and then Loiterman, and you can see Argyle is a, just a little bit overutilized. Thank you. Okay, so next slide, please. So now we move on to Crown. And again, we saw this slide um, at our last work session. The um, clusters that are in blue were the ones, as I said, were identified to be part of uh, populating the new Crown High School. And then the ones that are in green are uh, Damascus and um, Clarksburg. And the idea is that Damascus Capital Project will be an expansion as well and be able to accommodate some of the students from Clarksburg into Damascus. The considerations that we talked about at the last board meeting was do we do these project, these boundary studies separately? Do we combine them? Do we also then expand them to include other adjacent clusters? Um, you can see Gaithersburg is that touch point between two of the boundary studies. The northern part of, of Gaithersburg sort of touches Damascus. That southern portion touches those rest of those adjacent, um, those other um, clusters. And so if we go on to the next slide. Um, can we stop on that oh, yeah. one just one time, uh, just for a second, go back? Go back. I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to address, I had some um, folks reach out to me after our last work session when we were presenting these maps. And, um, you know, you can look at this, this map right now and it looks a little odd. You've got the Green Island and then you've got like a stem connecting two big, you know, blobs of blue. And people we're asking why, why are those boundaries so um, oddly drawn? So, so we, we can certainly go back <laughs> I mean, into the, the history books and, and determine. I think uh, if you do go back, um, you know, these, these portions of the county, um, you know, 20 years ago were very, very different than what they are today. These boundaries are... Uh, existing boundaries have been longstanding, have been in place for, for, for many, many years, um, and were in place to, to address, you know, the conditions at the time that they were created. And, and so, yes, when you look at them now, you, you sort of look at it and say, well, I don't quite understand why they, they look the way they do today. 
Um, but you know, not not to jump ahead of ourselves, but I think again, that's a, one of the reasons um, as part of the interim superintendent's recommendation is to think bigger and to see if you're able to address more of the clusters, um, uh, more of the existing boundaries in a way that reflects today's current um, conditions versus 20, 30 years ago when these were first created. Um, but but yes, you go back 20, 30 years, the Seneca Valley cluster very very different um, you know, conditions, very different development situations. Obviously, Clarksburg, we've seen what has occurred in Clarksburg. Clarksburg's a rather new cluster for us, um, which, which transitioned um, some of those clusters at that time. But Gaithersburg um, you know, certainly uh, is one that um, was, was developed many years ago when, when the conditions and, and the development of both the, 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 the city area of Gaithersburg and then the rural area of Laytonsville and others looked very different than what they do today. So um, again, this is an opportunity for us to revisit and address the current conditions versus continue forward with, with conditions that were in place 30, 30 plus years ago. And if I can also just add, um, as you know, you have a board policy that has um, the factors that you're supposed to be looking at when looking at boundary study recommendations. That island assignment, Ms. Harris, that you referred to in green is the Fox Chapel and Daly um, service areas that were, when Clarksburg was developed, were part of, so they were the initial service areas that went to Clarksburg. And we did have very robust conversations when we were doing the Seneca Valley and Clarksburg and uh, Seneca Valley, Clarksburg and Northwest Boundary Studies, thank you, um, and talked about those service areas and those at the end, as part of the recommendation and of course board approval, those service areas remained in the, um, the uh, Clarksburg service area and so that is the island assignment that you see there. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, then we could go to the next slide. So the recommendation for the boundary study is, or the recommendation is to combine the two boundary studies into one, to expand it, to include additional um, clusters, to have that, as Mr. Adams said, you know, that bigger, broader look. Are there opportunities to uh, change boundaries? Certainly in a boundary study, that will happen regardless, but you, it, it's a further breadth that you can look at, um, especially in this area. I do want to note that this um, slide was revised. Thank you, Ms. Yang, to include um, Wooten. Wooten was part of the map. I just left it off the list. So that is now official. It is now included in the list. So these are all the high schools clusters that would be included. There are, I believe, 11 of them and the associated middle schools all the middle schools that are within that cluster, within all of those clusters, no elementary schools as part of the recommendation are included in the boundary study. Next slide. And again, this would be the recommended timeline. It is the same timeline as Woodward. So these would be going on sort of simultaneously. Um, we would start the process again now, start doing that request for a proposal, approved by the board, preparing uh, once the consultants are hired, preparing with them the data, how the process would be, then going out to the community, and then uh, the report will be released in early January, recommendation early February, with board, work session, public hearing, action, finishing up by the end of March. And again, having that same opportunity, almost a year and a handful of months, to engage the community about those reassignments and introducing them to new schools and, and so on. I just want to pause a little bit here for Crown and Damascus. Uh, for Crown, what's the opening uh, of Crown, projected opening? 2027, the same as the reopening of Woodward. And for Damascus? And Damascus right now on its schedule, 2027. Okay, thank you. But thank yes, you 2027. Yeah. Yes, a lot going on in that in that year. But just to clarify, Damascus was identified as as one of the non-recommended schools. So we're still, you know, as we go through the process, that that completion date will will come to light in in the future months. 
Um, but as we mentioned before, there is the opportunity to do this from an implementation approach as, as well, even if Damascus is delayed and not on the same 2027 timeline as, as Crown. Okay, so next slide. So again, this is the data for the high schools. Um, and you can see which ones are overutilized, which ones do have some space. Um, you know, starting at the top, Churchill is a little overutilized. Clarksburg, of course, is overutilized, almost 500 students. Damascus, you can see that space there. That space, because we're looking at the last year, does include that expansion. So the idea of having that room to reassign those students in. Um, Gaithersburg, you can see, is over by about 200 students. Um, again, you can keep looking uh, northwest. Um, I'm sorry, Richard Montgomery, about 400. Northwest, about 200. Quinn's Orchard is almost 500 students overutilized. So you can see all of that overutilization. Again, the overutilization is about 2,100 students. Um, and again, of course, that includes the available space. When you have a, the available capacity, includes both Crown and the expansion of Damascus High School. It also includes um, the expansion of Wooten High School. We had talked about that. At one point, Wooten was overcrowded. They are not overcrowded the way they once were. Um, and so the CIP does reflect that expansion. And I put here that we will look in October, as we always do, whether or not some of these um, projects that include expansions sort of reflect the, the right amount of additional capacity. So that's something we certainly will review and will be in our CIP for October. So once the boundary study starts, we know what capacity is actually available. Um, it does show the available capacity when looking at all of these schools, about 3,400 seats. But part of that is because we've now expanded the boundary study to include those adjacent schools. Again, there's just opportunity there to then look further beyond those schools that were identified um, as part of the boundary study. So uh, just to clarify, so after all of these projects are complete, we will have capacity for 3,400 Seats. Based upon the enrollment projections that are here now and based upon the capacity that is reflected in the CIP. So, for example, like we may look, we look at Wooten, does, do we need to build all of that capacity? The same thing with Damascus. We may look and say, based on enrollment projections, maybe not all that capacity is needed. But that's something that, again, being closer to when the boundary study starts and based upon the enrollment, we can take one more glance at that before we start the boundary study. Is 3,400 seats a lot? It seems like a big number. So um, I, I think when you're looking at all of these schools, it probably isn't. Um, if you were looking at four or five schools and that we had that kind of capacity. But when you're talking about 11 um, high schools, that isn't a whole lot of capacity. Um, and again, opportunities, you know, we talked, I know, at the last board meeting about programs, about looking at CTE programs. Does it give an opportunity to put programs at maybe a couple of these different high schools? That won't happen. It can happen simultaneously during the process, but not as part of the boundary study process. And if you do that, are there any opportunities for either applying in or the programs are just there? In which case, those programs do take up more space. I would also add to it, I, I think as you add more of the schools, you do start to see schools like um, Watkins Mill with capacity that adds to the, you know, adds to the capacity. It gives us an opportunity to look at these, these schools very differently. And even a school like Wooten, you know, we originally started that as a, this idea of possibly expanding it. Um, you know, as we see challenges with the start date of that particular project, this actually might give us an opportunity to look at look very differently at that building, have a very different approach. And what I mean by that is maybe two classrooms today turn into one in the future, right? So to, to address a shortage of, of you know, science and technology space. So I, I do think having this type of capacity affords us a lot more opportunities to think about our existing buildings um, moving forward. But as Adrian said, 3,400 seats over the 11 schools is, is very equivalent 
to what we were looking at from a Woodward <coughs> perspective with a, with a smaller number of, of, of students and that excess capacity. So, um, you know, when you think about it, it does break it down to around that 5% over uh, piece for individual schools. So it will give us opportunities to look at, at each and every one of these schools a little differently as we go through the, the boundary process. So you said 5% over capacity for each school. Sure. And, and again, you don't know exactly which school is going yeah, to no, look no. like. I'm just but, um, trying you know. to address some uh, concerns I've heard in terms of why are we building so much when the birth rate is down? Uh, don't we just need to get over this slump and then we'll be right-sized? And I think we need to address that explain that to the community why that's not the case and, and we we need to also address and explain that to our, our our council colleagues you know the these students are are here right so the birth rate has has leveled off but the students are are here from the elementary in the middle and high you see the overutilization of the high we haven't seen major dips at the elementary school level right you've seen it level off so what we've seen over time is those students matriculate through to the high school level, and if we do nothing, you will continue to see five, 600 students over at the high school level. So, so I think this idea of overbuilding, um, yes, we're not going to go out and build a high school above and beyond this where we are today because we're not seeing the numbers of the birth rates, we're not seeing the numbers of international enrollment, but those students are maintaining a level of, of enrollment at, that, at those grade levels that will translate into the same numbers we're seeing um, in the sixth year of this CIP. So, so, so again, I, I, don't, I don't, you're right, was, we have to do some myth busting around this idea that we're overbuilding, but we are not overbuilding. Um, this will just give us more opportunities from a boundary study perspective, uh, will give us more opportunities from a program perspective at the high school level. Thank you. And uh, if I could just add, add to your point, really, being a student at Richard Montgomery, which has about 400 students over enrolled, uh, I think sometimes, you know, you see those numbers and you say, oh, give or take, you know, it's over enrolled, but the school still functions. I mean, we have portables surrounding every side of our school. And I mean, the impacts of that are huge. I mean, we have so many parking spots gone. Uh, students can't even find a time to get to school on time, which causes them to miss class. People have to walk literally a mile every morning to get to school because the portable blocks parking spots. Um, you know, class sizes, you know, it causes overfilling in class size. I mean, I see the impacts of a school um, where, you know, the, the bell rings in your shoulder to shoulder and you can barely make it on, you know, time to your class because you have so many people surrounding you. Of just 400 students, and we have schools here that are nearly eight to 900 students over enrolled, and that's something where I want to reiterate your point is we look at this as numbers, but when you're actually in the school that's, that's over enrolled, the impacts of that are huge, and it's a problem that really cannot be overstated. So, you know, I just want to, like, fully, you know, agree with your point, um, not, you know, just about the numbers, but about the actual experience that that has for students. I mean, looking at these projects and looking that they're going to alleviate a lot of that, you know, over enrollment is... Is, is extremely exciting to me as a student because you know you know getting rid of portables at schools, making sure that students can make it to class on time, making sure those you know schools aren't in the hallways aren't overcrowded. I mean that is that is a really really important aspect of our school day. And I've I've been at Richard Montgomery you know all four years. Um, you know I've seen multiple. I mean we have COVID of course, but I've seen years where it's been over enrolled. And I mean it is a struggle. And I can't even imagine what it looks like in schools that have double the overcapacity rates than we do. So I just want to you know reemphasize that to the community like and our millions of viewers, of course, that it's a, it's a big issue. And looking at it in numbers cannot, you know, even begin to state how bad the problem actually is when you're there. So I just want to reiterate the importance of these projects as you're describing them. I, I just wanted to add question, that. Follow up question to that, though. Um, the 3,400 seats, does that include, incorporate the um, overcapacity or are you saying, so in other words, it'll really only be 1,300 available seats after you were... Right. The it's the difference. So, yes, it's the difference. But you have an overutilization, and then you have, based upon all of those projects, once they're all done, 3,400 seats. So, okay, I, st I don't, still don't feel like you answered my question. Is the, yeah. when everything's all said and done and all there, no one's overcrowded, will there be 1,300 seats or will there be 3,400 seats? There'll be, 30, there'll be 1,300 seats. Oh, correct. That's what correct. I wanted Right, so Thank you're you. over by X, you have Y. So right. once that X gets filled, that's what you have left. Okay. It's 13. Just wanted to clarify yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I was sitting here thinking, I'm like, it's really only 1,300. That's not that much. Yeah. Okay. 
again, for 11 schools. And I think that that's what Mr. Adams was saying was about the 5%. You know, we're not building so that every school is at capacity. We always want a little wiggle room for growth, for program, for special ed, for all of those other things. So let's not, um, yeah, let's emphasize that 1300 number. I don't see it on the slide there. Right. Yeah. We can move on. Don't make them do math. So the next slide, again, is just the map so that you can see where that overutilization is where there is a little capacity. So for example, and remember again, this map reflects this school year. Um, it's not the last year, it's this school year. So you could see all those um, overutilizations. You could see where there's a little bit of capacity. I just wanna point out um, the white for Gaithersburg, it, it almost looks like it's not part of it, but the white actually is, it's basically at capacity. So if you look at the legend, you could see that white is 50 seats available to 49 over. I know it looks kind of odd when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, we didn't include Gaithersburg in the map, but it's there. It's just that's, that's the color that's reflected for that, um, for that number, underutilized, overutilized. The next slide, there are no questions. The next slide just reflects the middle schools. Again, all of the middle schools that will be in the, uh, as part of the boundary study, in the boundary study, you could see there is uh, mostly space. There are a few uh, service areas that are a little bit overcrowded. Uh, the one all the way at the top is Baker. And then the other one that's sort of in that light blue color is Rocky Hill. Right, so it goes, the green is um, available seats to the white is a little bit over, and then the blue starts that overutilization. Okay, any questions? No, move on. Next slide, please. So again, this is the last slide. This is the one I showed. So basically moving forward, the recommendation is to do these two boundary studies. The one in the yellow is the Woodward boundary study, including all of those clusters. And the one in blue is, is to do the, and what we're calling it is the Crown Damascus um, boundary study to include all of those clusters. And again, both the uh, high schools, middle schools, no elementary schools. And I think that's it. Next slide is just for discussion. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, please turn on your lights. Ms. Yang. Um, one question for clarification question. Um, because um, after our last work session, this question came to me. So no elementary school is included. Can it be interpreted as if there is a boundary change of a middle school, a whole elementary school will might be uh, going to a new sc new school. Is that yes? Yeah, so the way I, I try to explain it is, if mm. if we do a boundary study today mm -hmm. and your student goes to Apple Elementary School, mm -hmm. regardless of their uh, the shift of the middle school and the high school they will always still be at Apple Elementary School. If they're a first grader there, boundary study gets approved, they will remain there. Their middle school can change and their high school can change, but their elementary school will not change. Oh, so if to clarify, if they are, their elementary school, can the elementary school have a split articulation? That's my question. So it can because, so for example, an elementary school currently that has a split articulation can maintain that split articulation or during the boundary study process, it could change because that's a change in their middle school assignment, mm. not their elementary school assignment. An elementary school that doesn't have a split articulation now once the boundary study is approved, it is possible it has, it, it gets a split articulation, meaning half of those kids can go to one middle school and half of them can go to another. So a middle school assignment can change, a high school assignment can change, but not the elementary school assignment. Okay, uh, my second question for clarification is, um, during our work session one, uh, when we were talking about Woodward High School, uh, one of the proposal or one of the scenario is to have phase three, gym and auditorium and athletic parking, uh, athletics and parking structure C 
to, um, to postpone that part? And how many years can you withdraw? Sure. So um, what was introduced at the, at the previous meeting mm. was the idea of um, constructing the athletic amenities, the auxiliary gym, um, remaining site work as part of phase two of Woodward, and then the auditorium as phase three. Um, so as we, we go through the boundary study process, um, obviously, you know, de depending on what happens with that, that's, that's certainly something that we will, we will bring back for uh, a, a vote and a decision by the board on the 19th, because that will change the approved scope of that project and even the timeline of those projects. But if that does happen, then certainly uh, families that are boundaried into Woodward, we will have to have you know robust con discussions around the timeline of that auditorium and what it means um, or what are the impacts or, or uh, other opportunities of students that are at that school during the time of no auditorium. Okay. But 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 I don't know. We don't know the timeline yet. I mean, so if that gets approved, we would have to request additional funds for the auditoriums at both Crown and at Woodward. Um, and then depending on on the timeline of when they were approved, that would determine the opening date of, of the auditorium. OK, so in this scenario that we are discussing is the phase three is auditorium. But right now we don't have a timeline, proposed timeline. It's depending on on funding right. okay the phase two is the gym and that's 22 million dollar we have money allocated for that is that would that be completed uh one school open on the uh 27 yes that's correct okay okay thank you for the clarification okay any other questions if not then let me just check make sure i haven't heard from this Rebecca Oven? No? Okay, we can move on. All right, so if we could go to the next slide, and, and I will ask our, our uh, curriculum colleagues to come down for our discussion around the Damascus project. Um, but before we get into Damascus, that's actually something uh, around the Wooten um, and the Crown, or not the Wooten, the, uh, uh, the Woodward and Crown projects. Um, because we did introduce a change of scope at the last meeting around building the auditoriums as, as a following phase, that will we will bring that back to the to the board um, on the 19th uh, with a resolution to amend uh, the timeline and scope of those projects. So again, when, when we hear from our um, communities tonight around that topic, uh, I just wanted to to revisit and clarify that there will be a decision around that particular approach for those those projects. The alternative is if we do not do that, then the alternative is to ask for the additional funds um, for the auditorium at this time, and then that would pause the start of those those projects. So just wanted to clarify that on, on those two particular projects before we, we go any further into the conversation. Just, yeah, just to clarify then for the, you know, millions watching at home, um, talking about uh, specifically Woodward and the three stages. Um, could, you, could you just remind everybody um, which, what is phase one, phase two, phase three, and what are the time appro approximate timelines for each of those phases? Sure. So for, for the Woodward project, phase one consisted of, of really building the bulk of, of the academic spaces. Um, and uh, we're, we're constructing that for Northwood to transition in as a holding facility, and that is scheduled to be complete this summer for Northwood transition in this summer. Um, that would allow us to start the Northwood project uh, this fall. Uh, Northwood would be there for three years while we construct the Northwood project. And during their stay at Woodward, we would continue into phase two, which consists of the athletic amenities, the, uh, the, the baseball field, the softball field, the track, the stadium. Um, also, a, the parking, the additional parking that's, that's included, it involves a parking structure, uh, as well as an auxiliary gym space and fit out of additional classrooms for the ultimate opening of Woodward. So that's phase two. Uh, and that would be complete for the summer of 2027 for the ultimate opening of, of the school. And then the phase three auditorium is to be determined around the, the completion date. But, but certainly under this proposal, we would um, request additional funds 
um, and that those funds would translate to a completion date for the auditorium uh, for phase three. So we, we don't necessarily know what that, that completion date is for today, but the, for phase one and phase two, as we know it, they are, that is the, the schedule. Two. And just a question for, um, so I'm doing a, a shadow day at Northwood tomorrow, and I will be um, in several dance classes uh, during the day. And um, so one of the things some of the students have been asking me is there's a very robust dance program at, um, at Northwood, and they do concerts and performances. And how, do, we, do we yet know how we will accommodate them with uh, performances? Sure. So the, the Woodward facility actually was, to some extent, tailored to some of the aspects of Northwood. So dance... Uh, the dance program was taken into account and there's spaces to to serve not only the program during the day or but also performances um, after hours as well but in terms of some of the final logistics of of whether or not they would have a performance at the woodward facility or, or something closer to home is, is is yet to be determined and i think depending on those performances certainly we will we will make those uh, decisions or the school will, will be a big part of making those decisions as we move forward but the spaces will be there to really support the current programs of of northwood thank you i just yeah um clarification we just talked about what were uh, for the crown high school um last week in um in our uh, phase uh in our work session one uh there was also a proposal of not building the auditorium, which is another $20 million. Is that one also no set day? Is it the same as Woodward? Correct. The, okay. the, the two are exactly okay. identical in terms okay. of approach. Thank you. Ms. Wolf? I, I just want to understand, phase two is athletic facilities in Northwood and Woodward, between Woodward. Why, why is the athletic field coming before the auditorium? Is that because you can work outside and there's students in the building? Well, well, mostly because of how the funding scenario worked. There, there is a, a funding that's that's the funding we have would allow us to complete the exterior athletic amenities. The funding we have would not allow us to construct the auditorium. Um, so our recommendation is to move forward with the athletic facilities. Um, at both schools, and, and this is a, that was a similar theme at both Crown and Woodward. I think that's important for you to raise because the auditorium serves the students during the day and with the programs that they have, whereas the athletic field they could share with another school easily. So, you know, that would be my question. So I think it's important that you raise that. And, and so that's a, that's a good point, but it, but also the the outdoor spaces are not just for extracurricular athletics; it's also for physical education uh, programming as as well. So, when we look at all these spaces, yes, every one of these spaces the the outdoor amenities, the parking, the auditorium yes, they impact students on on a on a daily basis. Um, but I don't I don't want anyone to think that the athletic spaces are only for extracurriculars. These are for our day-to-day -day use from a from a, um, a physical education perspective as well. So then if they need to hold an all-student session, what do they do? That needs the auditorium? A school, a school assembly, for example. Yeah. Sure. So we, there's, there's, there's multiple opportunities. Um, you know, so actually we don't necessarily design our auditoriums for that purpose now. Our, we focus our auditoriums on more of a performance approach than we do an assembly approach. Um, assemblies, you know, we actually spend quite a bit of time even at the Woodward around this idea of where would those grade level assemblies be and we constructed space as part of the cafeteria to be able to conduct those grade level um, types of, of assemblies in the same at, at Crown. So I just, again, the, the auditoriums are not we're really focusing them on performance spaces and not assembly spaces, and that's been a transition that we've implemented over the past probably five, six, seven years. I think it's important that you bring all of those points up. Thank you. Will that be I agree with uh, Ms. Wolf, and I'm wondering, will that be incorporated in public hearings further down the road, or when does that final decision? In other words, if you were to build the auditorium before the Switch phase one or two and three. 
When does that get looked at? So that, that would be tonight. The public hearing would be, you know, to focus on, on you know, any comments that are associated with that. Um, you know, that would be part of a board resolution on the 19th, March 19th, to allow us to move in this direction. Um, beyond that, then, then yes, the, the comments would be around the additional funding, the, the timeline, the, the ultimate scope and approach around the, the auditorium phase two or three, depending on which school we're talking about. How much does an auditorium cost? These days, it's in, de it's, in today's <laughs> dollars. <laughs> these days, it's it's in the neighborhood of twenty million dollars for million. these projects. So it it will be more two or three years from now. Well, um, that's that's there's the likelihood that it could cost marginally more. Um, you know, it, it, there will be added costs just because there's remobilization of contractors. So yes, it's it's not necessarily cheaper to do it later. But um, you know, again, this is this is based on on a pure dollar perspective, and if, if there's not sufficient funds to do the whole project, you either stop completely or, or you break it down into pieces, and that's what we're proposing. I'm just asking, because I think these questions are gonna come from the public as to why you build an athletic field before you build an auditorium. So, thank you. Ms. Harris? Yeah, just one question that goes not even to these two projects, but, um, are we similarly proposing to stage Northwood? So in, in doing building first, amenities, external amenities second, auditorium third, or are we, do we have a different plan? For when, I'm, and I'm thinking specifically when Northwood after their three years at what they're calling North Woodward, um, you know, for their holding time and they move back to their new school, what will that school have as far as facilities and amenities? Yes, Northwood will have the full scope. You know, we, again, actually last week, the, uh, uh, it was discussed around the supplemental appropriation for Northwood. We, we needed an additional, I believe it was $5 million. Um, it was a $9 million supplemental, but we needed an additional $5 million to complete the project in full. So when Northwood returns, they will have their full, um, their full scope of work, which, which we started out, which is building, parking, um, site amenities, auditoriums, they will have their full complement of spaces. Okay. And I think that's good to emphasize for that community because, the, you know, their next three years are going to be a challenge for them for lots of reasons. So, so Mr. Adams, just so that I'm understanding um, the Woodward phases. So when I joined the board, we talked about two phases, right? The, the fields later. Well, actually, at first it was no fields, but... Uh, we're beyond that now, the, the school and then the fields. Um, so are you saying that there wasn't enough funding for the school with an auditorium and that's why we've broken that out into a separate phase three? Is that how that came to be? Yes, yeah, so when we when we bid this project, we, we bid it based on the different elements. So there was the auditorium piece, there was the parking structure piece, there's the auxiliary gym piece, there's the field piece, there's the stadium piece. Um, we know we need parking, so that, that was sort of a common theme. Uh, so we looked at term, in terms of, of with parking, with some of the other site aspects that we need to have, stormwater management, all those pieces, what other elements could we actually afford to do today? Coupling those mandatory pieces around stormwater management parking with the auditorium, we do not have enough funds to do that. So coupling it with the other field and outdoor spaces, yes, we do have enough funds to, to be able to move forward. Um, so I, I, I'm, to answer your question, yes, the second phase was supposed to be everything. It was supposed to be the auditorium. As, as you recall, one of the reasons we, we broke the auditorium out at the beginning is we were thinking uh, around, does this auditorium, does the performance space need, need to look a little different? Is this going to be possibly a, we, we, we definitely didn't say it was a magnet school, but would this be possibly a, a school to have a unique program um, that could help attract students versus boundary students in. Um, so there's been a variety of thinking and different approaches with this one, and that's the reason why it was broken out. But where we are today is, again, there's just not enough funds to do all of it. Um, and, and for us to break it down into to bite-sized pieces, um, the pieces that we have to do and then the pieces, again, we have to do all of it, but the pieces that we have to do and then the pieces that um, you know, we can also afford that are beyond that is what we are, we are presenting to you. And you have the funding for the fields because that was appropriated separately? So, so we have the funding for phase two. 
so the, the appropriation for phase two is whole, but within that appropriation for phase two, it's not enough to do everything uh, that we, we have designed and, and presented, so. I guess I'm just trying to understand why you've chose the fields over the auditorium. Well, again, when, when looking at it from just a, a budgetary standpoint, there's, there's not enough money to do the auditorium. So the only way we could do the auditorium is if we said, okay, we're not going to do any of the parking, we'll hold on stormwater management, um, and then obviously not do the fields and just do the auditorium. At, at that point, um, you know, I think it would be really challenging to have a performance space and then no way to... Uh, have students or, or families, you know, even attend from a parking perspective or from a from a, a site amenity perspective. Um, it, so it's just purely from a funding standpoint in terms of how the different elements of the project, uh, you know, came out from a bid perspective. But you could do fields first and then the auditorium. Yes, from a funding. I'm sorry, the other way around. Auditorium first. No, there's not enough money for the auditorium, Correct. but there is enough money for the fields yes. currently. Yes. Okay. Correct. Um, you mentioned that um, the change about the auditorium that you have notified affected communities. Can you speak more about that? Who has been notified that, so that they can come testify tonight? So as, as part of the notification, it, it was through the, you know, the work session piece of the Board of Education. In terms of individual communities, um, I I don't believe we sent out uh, a broad email to all the schools that could be impacted by the Crown High School. Um, in terms of Woodward, uh, I believe we've talked about a variety of approaches with, with the project team themselves, um, but I will have to certainly um, you know, come back to you in terms of what other broad messaging has gone on around it. But they would have had to have watched our work <coughs> session is what you're saying. Yes, or participated in, in project meetings and participated in PTA meetings. Okay. Okay. Um, let's continue. This is just the first slide of our second portion of the presentation. Okay, so let's, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Continue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please. So for Damascus High School, we're going to we're we're bringing this back to just talk about the the overall project again as a whole. You know, as we talked at the first work session, option one, option two, really just around where we construct on the site. Um, you know, along Ridge Road, along um, Bethesda Church. Uh, you know, I, I I believe during the community meetings, definitely a little bit more energy around maintaining the presence of of the high school along Ridge Road. Um, you know, but certainly that's something that as we continue with the project, as we as we learn more around from the council perspective around the timeline, we'll continue that engagement of, of that community. Uh, but today we did want to focus on the automotive program. That's certainly um, something that has has garnered you know quite a bit of attention not only at the board level but also at the uh, county council. Uh, at the last education and culture meeting, you know, we, we had some robust conversation with uh, several council members. Um, certainly a desire around uh, maintaining the automotive program. I, I, I think, you know, again, there's the idea of, of do you maintain as it or reconstruct as it is today? Um, do you reconstruct with a different vision or do you just move the program altogether? We're not proposing eliminating the program. We're proposing a different approach. And so today we want to spend a, a little bit more time um, showing some visuals around uh, really some inspirational images that we've we've developed with uh, with the team that we've talked about. We've you know we talked with um, different stakeholders that that are a part of this. So if, if we go go to the next slide, um, we felt this was a, an important slide. This is uh, you know again just images around how learning in different career and technology spaces is is happening uh, across the country. Really taking advantage of of aspects of virtual reality. Um, taking advantage of, of different lab space, um, breaking down parts and pieces of, of the work, the curriculum, um, so that you're not necessarily looking at a full car perspective at, at first. You're breaking it down into, you know, different uh, bite-sized pieces for, for learning opportunities. You know, again, this is a, uh, an accredited 
program um, that's in a different part of the country right now uh, that is that is utilizing lab type space to start the introduction of, of the work and then transition into to larger spaces. So we felt the idea of, of bringing this to the table was important. And again, virtual reality was a big part of our thought process around Seneca Valley uh, construction trades as well. Um, spent quite a bit of, of time benchmarking that um, there's opportunities for students. A lot of this work particularly virtual reality lab space happens at post K-12 levels. But, but for us, I think it's really important to think, again, think forward facing and how do you bring that into our high school curriculum now? If we go to the next slide. And, and this is actually the construction trades at Seneca Valley. Um, you know, so really thinking about this in terms of uh, flexible space you know, you could see from the last slide, you know, the slide to the right is really that lab space, you know, for students to do a variety of different, um, you know, engagement with, with technology. Uh, that could be computer elements, that could be virtual reality, that could be hands-on, you know, work. The space to the left is um, a, a very, a much smaller size of the Edison Mall. If, if anyone has, has toured Edison, you have that grandiose mall space that's there. For Seneca Valley, we thought it was really important to um, have a similar approach, flank a, 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 a lab, a large lab space with classroom spaces. So, so if you can visualize this, the space to the right would be directly off of the space to the left. So students are able to be in lab space and then go into more of a, a, a larger hands-on space. Instructors are able to, to bring out um, different aspects of, of the curriculum. It could be a whole car. So if you envision you know, a lift here or two lifts here, could you bring in a car versus having you know, a complement of eight to 12 different lifts? I mean, just having the ability to have a very flexible space and be able to have um, you know, different approaches to the work. Uh, so it felt it was really important to show the spaces. We're very proud of these spaces because I think it does provide a lot of opportunities for students and the curriculum to evolve over time as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide. These were some of the inspiration ideas. You know, again, so sort of taking what we see at Seneca Valley and the construction trades to what, what you see as, you know, different approaches in the industry. And again, a lot of this is, is post K-12, um, but, but taking this from, a, from an idea perspective of how do you, again, break down um, different aspects of the curriculum. If you're able to bring in, let's just say, 16 engines in a space, um, you know, that, that actually gives so much more opportunities for students versus bring in just have large spaces, whole cars, and just focus on that one aspect of, of the curriculum. So again, not thinking about doing away with the program, just thinking about how do you approach it differently and have you know, more access to students. We've also heard you know, the idea around you know, there's, there's limitations with the current spaces at spaces like Seneca Valley. Um, we've talked about, again, if, if students were to transition to Seneca Valley for a different aspect of their curriculum, maybe the, the year two, year three, or, or somewhere in, in, in between, is there enough space? If, again, if you think about it from that perspective, yes, we're talking about space from a limitation because we've taken up a large percentage of, of the area um, with inflexible you know, opportunities. But, but even at Seneca Valley, you have the opportunity to bring in different sections. You have the opportunity to bring in different instructors to bring in more, more opportunities for students. So I, I think there's a variety of opportunities, but a space like this really does enhance the opportunity to have more students um, participate and has the opportunity to participate in a lot of different elements at even different times of, of their curriculum journey as well. And then I think if you go to the last slide on this particular topic, it's, it's really focusing on uh, sort of, the, again, as we talked about, the next generation job. This is, you know, this is, uh, you know, electric vehicle, you know, transitioning from that combustion engine to an induction motor and what's involved in that. You know, I think it's really important for us to start thinking about how do we, how do we teach our students around, you know, what's involved in an, an electric vehicle. You know, you can see a couple images here. You see the, the bank of, of batteries that's, that's underneath a, a, a Tesla vehicle. Uh, how those batteries trans translate into the, the image above, you know, whether it goes through an inverter to an induction engine to, you know, the coolant system for the batteries. It's just a very sort of different way of approaching this. And if we have flexible spaces, we're able to bring in different opportunities like this along the way. 
uh, to give our students not only you know the academic experience that they need from today's perspective, but for but for the future. Um, so we thought this was really important to bring to the table. You know, again, from the idea of not necessarily from not moving away from the program, but for us, really thinking differently. And I would almost say double down on the program from a CTE perspective and, and provide more opportunities for more students in a more innovative approach. Um, so I guess maybe we can go to the next slide or maybe stop would here. You we'll just go said, back to the slide. Would that be different from if we included the automotive program, like if it was amended? Yes. Yeah, so, so what I show you there is included in the Damascus project and, and the Damascus scope today. Okay, that's right. Um, what is being advocated for is more of the traditional uh, automotive space that you would see at Seneca Valley or Edison. Um, so, what we're proposing, you know, again, is is to move forward with the current approach to the automotive program at Damascus. Um, but if you were to offer up an amendment to include additional funds, as we mentioned before, $12 million to build the traditional, uh, we would most likely move away from these lab spaces or, or move them into a different direction and construct the, the traditional um, automotive space and, instead. Dr. Felder? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, so, Mr. Adams, could you also just speak to uh, if we go the traditional route, um, that would also eliminate uh, space that's needed for um, more student capacity, correct? That's, that's correct. So as, as we showed, um, you know, a few slides back uh, for the Damascus site, it is, it is a tight site. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a renovation addition piece. So uh, to include the, the larger footprint space that we're referring to as the traditional automotive, um, it, it would either have to take away from space and program of the of what we're proposing or it'd have to go to a different space take away different uh, uh, outdoor amenities whether that be parking athletics other PE spaces so yes dr. Felder um, the additional money doesn't necessarily get you more space it just gets you more specific technical space that takes up a greater footprint um, so we'd have to really look at it in terms of what we would lose um, you know, from a footprint perspective moving forward. Mr. Said, Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that. I think that was that was really thoughtful and in-depth, and thank you for addressing that. I just have a couple quick clarification questions. So I know the current program at Damascus has that kind of, like, um, dealership sort of thing where they can bring in, you know, actual, you know, used cars, like repair them. Will the new program have that opportunity in the lab space? So, so no, I do not believe that we would have the opportunity to bring in whole vehicles at the same um, numbers that we see today there. Uh, would there be the opportunity to work on a smaller number of whole vehicles based on the space? Possi there's a, it's a strong possibility. Uh, but to continue the model that exists today, uh, no, not within the space that, that we're showing. And I'm also curious, because I'm looking at um, you know the document here where we see like the enrollment of all the different programs at different schools. What program does Gaithersburg have? Do they have the more traditional style, or do they have that newer style that you're talking about? So thank you, thank you for that question. Yeah. So we um, have two auto programs in the county. We have the automotive technology, which is currently available at um, Damascus High School. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the automotive collision repair program. So the automotive technology program at Damascus is also available at Seneca Valley. Uh, which is, I think, eight miles down the road. It's also available at Gaithersburg, and it's also available at Thomas Edison. The collision repair program um, that's currently at Thomas Edison is also available at Gaithersburg. So if we think of the traditional mm -hmm. auto tech program at Damascus, it is available at Seneca Valley, mm -hmm. where you have the brand new state-of-the-art um, hub, and it's also available at Gaithersburg High School and um, so both of them have it. And then kind of on that, on that point, at Seneca, how much, do you know how much capacity they have, like, for total student enrollment in that program? 
Because I know we have the number of people who are enrolled now. What is the capacity for that that's program? A great, that's a great question. So currently at Seneca Valley High School in our auto program, we have 44 students mm -hmm. who are enrolled in that program. So we have one teacher. Um, and so if we were to consider adding one more teacher or two more teachers, we would have the capacity to grow the program. So the program right now is being driven by staffing and the number of teachers. It's a large space. Um, the space does have um, multiple lifts within within the instructional mm -hmm. space and there's space behind the building. So there is an opportunity, there would be an opportunity to grow that program. Okay, I, I was, cause you know, I know I see like 57 students in the auto technology at Damascus, which is more than all of them right now at Seneca Valley. So I just have concerns like, if there's that much interest in the program, could we move that many students or would there have to be a lot of people who would be interested in that program who would have to be turned away because we wouldn't have the space for it. So that's why I was asking that. Like w with the additional staffing, you know, ballpark. I don't know if you can give me this number, but how much will we have space for 10 more students? Would it be 40 more students? Like, you know, generally, what would that look like? So that's a good question. So if you think about, so if we think of Seneca Valley as the up county hub, mm -hmm. and we think of Thomas Edison as our down county hub. So for example, at Thomas Edison right now, we have 190 students in our auto program. Mm -hmm. So we've grown that. And of course, Thomas Edison has been around for much longer than Seneca Valley. Seneca Valley is a new, the programs are new. Yeah. Um, so there we have, for example, in the automotive technology program, which is what Damascus has, Edison has 119 students. And mm -hmm. then in the collision repair, they have 71. 71 yeah. And so if we, over time, were to grow the programs at Seneca Valley, um, we would have an opportunity to do that. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I know Grace mm -hmm. has a question. I want to let her go ahead. I, actually, Ms. Uh, Harris has to um, let her go first. Just okay. Oh, yeah, um, I, so I did have a question. So in looking at the memo, and I did appreciate that you highlighted that the auto, we always, when I taught at Edison, called it the auto body program, but the collision repair is only at Edison and Gaithersburg right now. Um, and is there, um, and perhaps that's interest driven, is there a potential for also providing that course at the Seneca Valley Hub? At Damascus. No, I'm oh, thinking yes. about Seneca Valley. Oh. So it's something that we could explore. The Seneca Valley footprint is really large, and so um, I think that's something we could certainly uh, explore. Okay, and then looking at um, the, and I think I'm referencing the same chart that uh, Mr. Syed was looking at, the, the, the current year, 23-24 auto tech course enrollment at Damascus, and it's, um, uh, and it looks like in that program, what we see is a fair number of students do the, the first course, um, Auto Tech 1, and then uh, the numbers drop for the, for the Auto Tech Repair 2, and then um, fewer students continue the program for the full three years. Um, but when I look at this, given <clears throat> what you've talked about is the, the kind of space that is potentially being envisioned for Damascus, more of a lab space and a smaller hands-on space, which could accommodate maybe a, a couple of vehicles, not all the vehicles. Um, and would, which of these courses, so it looks like, again, there's a, there's a three, the possibility of a three-year program um, at Damascus right now. Um, auto, you know, auto tech one, two, and three. Um, which of these would not be available at Damascus with the current um, plan for the the new build? So thank you for that question. If I can just clarify one piece. So the automotive tech program currently at Damascus High School, it's a two-year program, and the students, too, in order to be considered completers, they need to complete the first two years, and each course is a double-period course. So in for year one, they get two credits. Year two, they get uh, two more credits. So the third year is actually an, actually an optional course. So if we look at the 17 students in the double-period class, those are the students who would be completing the program, and then that third level is optional. In terms of what the courses would look like in the new um, 21st century electric car program, um, that's something that we would have to look to see what the courses are. So this is more of the traditional pathway, and then over the years we would have an opportunity to look at um, some of the pathways that exist um, in different states, and then to see how they could be incorporated with some of the current courses. 
Oh, okay. Um, I, I guess I thought it was more. It was a more straightforward question than that, because um, just looking at would these three courses, and I guess it seems like the third one, the optional extra year, maybe is more of, of an apprenticeship type program. But um, would these classes be available at Damascus? In the new or no? So. In our thinking, we are looking at a different design. Um, but your question is interesting because I, th I think we would need to get, um, see what the limitations are on a smaller space to offer these exact courses. We were going in a modernization route, thinking about um, creating something new and different and innovative for Damascus. Um, given that right now the industry certifications, we would have to build that in. We would have to work with the state and work with other areas, and we've done that before, creating AI programs to be able to make sure that there's a credential that the students earn at the end. So we were not envisioning replicating the current program in the new flexible space. We were envisioning creating a new modern program, and so um, not these exact courses. But given I, maybe it's more toward the nature of the space, would it be possible? I mean, you said you know the the current the the new flexible space wouldn't have the same capacity for like driving vehicles into it that the current space does, but you could still bring some vehicles in. So if you wanted to, if they wanted to get students working on a whole car, it would still be possible given the space. I think that's something that um, there's a difference between, for example, having three cars in the space versus having a space that holds 40 cars. And so, you know, if we're looking at a couple of cars, um, the, based on what we've seen on the flexible space, a couple of entire cars could probably be fit in. And then as students are working on different units, whether it's engines or different components of the, um, of the car, those parts could be brought in um, with specificity and just focusing on that. So I think that there's an opportunity for innovation. Um, we would be doing something new and creative. And so with that, having this flexible space, having a large space um, based on what was presented, it appears that the space is quite large. Um, there would be an opportunity to um, carry over components of the current program. Okay, thank you. Dr. Felder? Yes, I just wanted to add that um, this is not about doing something new and creative just for the sake of doing something new and creative. It's about staying up with what the industry is seeking in its future employees. employees. So, um, you know, as we uh, seek to prepare students for the future, uh, we must stay up to date with the latest advancements in technology and uh, modes of instruction. Um, and so we have an opportunity here to design uh, the most innovative and state-of-the-art uh, automotive program for our students to have access to, one that mirrors what the industry is, is looking for with regards to skills and technology um, uh, in its future employers. So that's what we are uh, endeavoring uh, to do. And, uh, and also, it would save us millions of dollars. Mr. Veda Oven. Thank you so much um, uh, for for that. Um, I do have, before uh, anything, I do have a couple of questions. Staff, you said that you, may, you met with several stakeholders. Could you please tell me who those stakeholders were? Sure. So, so obviously, we've had our, our Damascus meetings over time. That included mm -hmm. many of the, the previous um, students that have have matriculated or have, have graduated from that program. Uh, we've also met with, um, you know, some of the, the the instructor and some of the core foundation folks. Um, I know I've I've had this similar conversation with uh, Mr. Bowden, who is is very active and I believe the director of part of this program. Um, we've talked to other businesses around. I can certainly give you different different ideas of, of different businesses. We've tried to set up tours of, of the Tesla facility so that we can have an idea of what that looks like. Um, but yes, we're, we're looking at it from a variety of, of, of different approaches. And, and I would just, and, and not to deviate from your, your stakeholder question, but um, one of the things that I, I think I, I feel very strongly about is that um, from the background that we have in the facility. So I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, went through, um, you know, basically a very automotive type of manufacturing approach. 
um, have worked on many assembly lines, have, have worked in a variety of different spaces outside of a K-12 setting. And, and so a lot of the colleagues that, that have, have been part of that journey over time have shared ideas around what, what, what it would, would be ideal to prepare students for the future. And, and so, again, not only just thinking about stakeholders, but even our curriculum folks around what, what academic elements do students need to understand. And I'll just, I'll just put this out here, right? So, you know, students today that are going through this automotive program are learning about alternators in terms of how that works with the, the, you know, the, the 12-volt system in terms of, this, of, of the existing vehicles. Are they learning about, you know, induction motors? Are they learning about the, you know, the different uh, electrical uh, approaches to these new vehicles? And the reason that's important for us is in a couple of weeks, we're also going to present at the fiscal management around what it means to implement our sustainability policy from the board, which means transitioning to all electric vehicles by 2027. So again, I, I think there's a there's a variety of, of stakeholders that are just even beyond the automotive piece that, that we're also engaged with. So just, again, very long-winded way of saying that. Have you, um, have you met with uh, the auto uh, trade board, who are our partners and who are the experts in this field, who have been working with these programs from the beginning of time? I have not met with the, the automotive, automotive trades program or uh, foundation program. And, and is there a reason why you haven't? So um, in looking at, if I can um, add, in looking um, at the idea for this innovative site, um, uh, Mr. Bowden has led um, conversation with the Automotive Foundations, um, and they have started a discussion on what some possible um, ideas could be around a structure for electric program or program that focuses on electric car. No, no, I, I totally understand that, but since we're saying that we're meeting with our stakeholders, and these folks have been from the beginning of time involved, I think, I don't know what, almost 50 years of the Damascus one, Gatesburg, I took classes at that program. <laughs> That's how old that program is, right? So for me, I just wanna make sure that um, when we are saying that we're meeting with our stakeholders and the people who are the folks who are the experts in these fields and who see kind of the trade and the need for auto mechanics, that that's what we're doing and if you're telling me you know that you haven't met with them then i i do have an issue with that personally because um this industry as you said and stated very well is growing dramatically and um and i i totally get that you guys wanted to be something new and innovative but when i look at the presentation i am not looking at um I'm looking at classrooms with computers. And I am not an expert in this industry, but lately I, I'm, I have done a lot of work and I've been sick for the last couple of weeks where so I've been reading up a storm on it. There's a lot of certifications that you need to get in this industry to even start a, um, a program when it comes to electrical uh, components. And from talking to those who do it, they said, in fact, the industry is very leery about letting high schools and others get those kind of certifications because they don't want them working on their cars unless they are fully certified. So it's not as easy as it sounds. But then going back to the traditional uh, program, I think one of the things that has bothered me from the beginning about this, and just to be transparent and honest with you guys, is the fact that I think a decision was made um, by whoever in MCPS to move in a non-traditional way to a more, um, as you said, innovative way of doing things without really talking to the folks um, on the ground and talking to the folks who, who do the program and the folks like the auto trade people who are the employers, who are the, you know, the folks who employ our kids, who give internship opportunities and so on to our kids. And to Mrs. Harris' point, um, I'm even looking at the whole body repair issue that that would be a perfect fit for, for Damascus, plus the lab to do uh, the mechanical um, uh, component to it. And then we're looking at doing all these boundary studies. We're looking at Rocky Hill being, you know, overcrowded and some of these in Blake and so on. So we know there's going to be a growth and I understand. But you said something very interestingly at the end is, you know, this will save us money. And I totally get about saving us money, but I also want us to be 
conversant of how important CT programs are, how important they are to the blueprint, how important they are to our children, to our youth. And when I looked at the numbers of Damascus, because I was getting some different numbers from you guys, um, saying that it was a lot less kids who were actually completing the program. And I just want us to compare apples to apples. So the other program is a double or triple period program. So to compare numbers with other programs enrollments, we should double the other numbers, not cut them. And again, comparing apples to apples. So when we say, you know, that, and I understand that we spent um, a lot of funding and so on in Damascus, my understanding is Damascus will not be able to provide um, the influx of the kids from 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 uh, from Damascus. I think there's like, I don't know, it was fluctuating between 64 and 62 the last time I checked of kids in the program with 18 kids to be completing the full program this year and then an influx of like 25 next year. Um, and I think the numbers that maybe you guys gave us were the ones where they were during COVID, which makes sense that they were low because they were not there in person. But for me, if we are trying to do something innovative and if we're trying to do and give different options to our youth, especially in that area of the county where we know that this is traditionally kind of like a bread and butter kind of program and it has the support of a whole community, um, I would really like us to really look at other alternatives. And I know, Seth, I spoke to you briefly before I lost my voice. That's why I haven't been able to call you in the last couple of weeks that there was actually a dealership across the street from Damascus High School that has all the blows and whistles to become an automotive program, which is a third of what this will cost. But we haven't even looked into that as an alternative. So my point is that it seems to me that sometimes we jump the gun to tell the community what it is that they need. We tell them our vision. We tell them what we want without really including them in the process and what is needed for those folks who actually live in that area, who go to school in that area, and who have been doing this program for so long. My understanding for talking to the folks in the industry is that the mechanical traditional program, yes, we're gonna be doing more, more, um, more of the electric work, but that has not gonna phase out for like decades. So there's gonna, including on our, you know, including even on our ride on and buses, right now we have a deficit of mechanics in this county. And we have a deficit in MCPS, I believe. And we have a deficit in Montgomery County government of mechanics. So it just does not make sense to me that we do this because then we're gonna go down the road and then we might realize, oh wow, we really need to add this. And that's gonna be an impossible situation because as you know, we're not ever gonna be able to add a program like this later on unless we do it from the beginning. So I know you said the 12 million, I'm still not clear what that 12 million will get us, but I still want us to look at the alternative from the other things across the street from the dealership and so on. Because if we truly, you know, if we truly are deliberate about doing this and doing stuff that's innovative, you cannot just, you know, do a classroom with computers and say, okay, we're being innovative. That to me is not being innovative. That to me translates we're just going to save some money. And I know that you sent us some data about some of the other programs that Damascus, and I know also one of the programs that I didn't see on this for, this, uh, for the new school was the hospitality management program as well. So I'm feeling a little bit like we're going away from supporting CT programs instead of implementing them and growing them and being online with even what the blueprint is asking of us. So, thank you. Does Mr. Veda Oven have the handouts that we have here in hard copy? We sent them to okay. Yes. Because the, the numbers I'm seeing are from the 23-24 school year. Exactly. Um, just wanted to clarify that, Mr. Do you have that memo, March, 20, March 6, 2024? No, I don't. Let me see. And the, uh, the CT programs that are listed on page two, those are in Damascus. Those are healthcare professionals, certified clinical medical assistant, justice law and society, and um, 
development of a new artificial intelligence. What about other kids going yeah, under consideration? I'm sorry, can you clarify? Certainly. So uh, for the auto program on top of page three, currently at Damascus High School, um, there are 34 students as of second semester. So page three, top of page three. Oh, okay. So, so there, the one that speaks to the auto programs. No, my my question was, what other CTE programs are at Damascus? Sure. So we can um, speak to the other programs. Did you want us to? Do you, do you also want us to speak to the current numbers in the auto program or no? The uh, other CTE programs. Sure. So they have a, a total of five um, five programs at um, Damascus. They have the Academy of Information Technology. There are 80 students enrolled in that. Auto Technology, the auto program, currently has 57 students. Their child development program has 77 students. Their horticulture program has 72 students. And the professional restaurant management, um, they did not have a teacher for that program. So at this time, there is uh, that program has no teacher. So the students who are interested are going to Seneca Valley. So Academy of Information Technology, 80. Mm -hmm. Auto, 57. Mm -hmm. Child Development, 77. Horticulture, 72. And Professional Restaurant Management does not have yeah, any really students zero. there right now because there's no teacher. But how many students are in the program that are going to Seneca? Uh, for the Restaurant Management, I think it's um, a couple of students. It's, it's a small number. I'll have to double check on that. Mr. Said. Yeah, so, uh, you know, out of curiosity, you know, I hear a lot about, you know, working on electric vehicles and moving into the future. If we maintain with the traditional space, are we not able to bring in electric vehicles and work on them? Like, it, is it exclusive to GAT? Like, but what my thing is, like, if we have that lab space, it restricts us. We physically cannot bring in the numerous cars we are now. But if we have that big open space, they can still work on electric vehicles. Uh, they can still work on all these new things. And so will, will that be limited? Am I wrong in believing that? So thank you for the question. Yeah. I think to put it in perspective, really um, using this as an opportunity to both meet the need for additional space for students for their primary learning um, and challenged by the footprint of the space, we were looking for ways to be able to use areas of the building seven periods a day. Uh -huh. um, so that student classes were not larger when we had more students coming in. We are fortunate in CTE to be able to build amazing programs in every high school. Mm -hmm. Every high school has great programs. We also are fortunate to have more than one technical high school that has really big modern uh, equipment that is designed to do those things that are not most places do not replicate their technical center, right? You have a high-tech center because it is expensive, it's costly, it's large, and kids have access all over the county. Because Montgomery County is so large, you have two. So you have Edison and you have Seneca Valley, which was the vision when Seneca Valley was built, was that that would serve as a hub to, to meet the needs of those high-expense, high, high uh, uh, large equipment, um, for up county students. Mm -hmm. So um, Mar, our thinking in, in considering all of it, and, and believe me, we're, we're CTE mm -hmm. advocates. We want the CTE programs to grow. We're also advocates that students have adequate learning space and that they're not in the hallways up against each other and, and <laughs> challenged yeah. by space for running from their cars. So we were trying to take all of the needs, right, and looking at what was the responsible thing to do. Is it responsible to take what exists in our up county hub and recreate it again a third time um, to be able to accommodate the 57 students at Damascus? If all 57 students were earning industry recognized credentials and they were all going through all of the courses and that's their career path, maybe that's the consideration. It's, uh, you know, that is a decision that the board would have to make. But we also believe that that is still available to the students. It is available at Seneca Valley for them to take the traditional program in the most state-of-the-art, brand-new um, place. I mean, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It has attached teaching spaces. There's room for more than one instructor. There's teaching areas. There's the main labs. There's where the lifts are. Um, and so in looking at the replication of the program, the used car dealership is a function of the foundations, and it is something that they have done for years historically to support the students who are in our programs. 
that is not part of the curriculum that's needed, right? What is needed is that the students need to be able to demonstrate their mastery and understanding of the skills on a vehicle. And so that's what we felt compelled to build or to, or to design, is that students would be able to have access in some way to be able to learn the skills. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a give and take, right? Um, do we continue that? Do we look at other areas um, to try and replicate a program that's existed for 40 years? Or do we take this as an opportunity to really, first of all, listen to what the students want? Because when we look at the student voice data for what they wanted in middle school, they want new modern programs at Damascus. And we want to be able to allow them to go to their home high school and not all have to travel. We know that some will, right? There's choice programs for a reason, but we also recognize that more students are leaving Damascus for other programs, um, and we think it's important that we be able to meet what, they, what students in the community who live in Damascus want in terms of their programming. We can create programs. We have to do a lot of work with the state and with the instructors and with our foundations, our business partners to backwards build. Um, but we're willing to do that to meet the needs of what the students want and what the industry demands. Okay, uh, I appreciate you know your explanation, but uh, I don't. I'm not, can we work on electric vehicles in the new facility? I think it's a very clear question. Is that a yes or a no? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. You know, if you constructed a Seneca, a repeat Seneca Valley, and, yeah. and we retooled it to focus on that, absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Ms. Wolf. I, I guess um, it seems to me that we created, as you said, Seneca Valley as a regional hub. And whenever we do that, we get pushed back from the local people. We, we saw that with the IB programs. Um, it's just to be expected, but I think it's our job to look to the future, to decide what is best for our students based on what we know the industry is looking for. Now, I don't know, I don't know Grace, what you looked at, but I do know this, that the airline industry is even teaching pilots on computers. Yes, they do have to go out and get flying time, but they start out on computers. Also, the number of students in the program, as they said, was as of March the 5th. But I think that um, we have to make some difficult choices here. So I, I actually wrote down my thoughts because as you were talking, a lot of things came to mind. So we're, we have Magruder and Wooten, they're delayed auditoriums. What we're doing now is picking and choosing between schools when we have available programs with space. That really concerns me. What also concerns me is I understand from some of the public comment that the students at Damascus don't want to go to Seneca Valley because of the students there. That is very offensive to me. And that is something that the board has always, always stood behind that you don't pick and choose based on the kinds of students at a particular school. So that's all I wanted to say. So my, my recommendation is that we stick with what was proposed because I do believe that electric vehicles are the way that we need to be going. Uh, I believe that we need to be forward thinking and we don't need to duplicate programs. Also, if you think about it, there are three programs, Gaithersburg, Damascus, Seneca Valley. You go down county and there's only one. What are you going to start doing? Creating duplicate programs down there? Because that's going to come up, that the down county is going to feel like this always happens. We get left behind. That makes no sense. We created two regional programs. There's space in these programs. Let's use these programs. Thank you. Ms. Wolf, I'm sorry, Ms. Yang. Okay, thank you. Um, I am. I would like to understand a little bit about the Damascus program. Uh, you know, I understand our students use it as um, for any CTE. Their students use it as interest exploration, take some classes, but might not finish the whole certification process. Um, I see it now as of March 5th, 2024, there are 17 students in the 
uh, second year of the program. But do all those 17 students get certified or there are other things coming up they have to complete in order to get certification? That's my question number one. My question number two is, uh, do we have some data in, for in the past years, how many students actually complete it and get certified at that, at that program? My third question is, um, there is a hub uh, down the way, eight miles. Can you share some facts of uh, how many current Seneca Valley students actually is you, not Seneca, the Mascot High School student is utilizing the Seneca Valley uh, programming? Thank you. Ooh. Did you get all the? I'm going to back. I'm going to back map it. Thank you. Um, and if I didn't, I'm sure Ms. Yang will remind me. Okay. So for the back mapping, the stu there are no students currently from Damascus High Schools uh, participating in Seneca Valley's auto program. No, no, no. I mean, is what is the certificate out of the 17 students here mm -hmm. at the Damascus program second year? Mm -hmm. What more do? They What's the projected number of them will finish with the certification? And how many in the past years have we certified, like yearly? Yes, you know, so, do so we have the, a data? Correct. And I think the third question was, are currently any mm -hmm. students from the Damascus Auto Program going? Not Auto no. For All Damascus Perfect. High School participating Perfect. in any Seneca Valley uh, okay. program. Got it. So in terms, mm -hmm. thank you. So in terms of our auto program, it's okay. So in terms of our auto programs, mm -hmm. um, we um, we look at two things. So there, there are TSA, Technical Skills Assessment Certification, the students can get after they complete the courses. Our auto program has over 30 different certificates students can complete. Those are local certificates. We also have industry recognized credentials, which are national, and those students complete after they have completed the program. In terms of just looking at program completion, so how many students we have a pathway at Seneca, at Damascus, for example, for this specific pathway, it's a two year program two credits per year. So when students are done, they have completed the pathway with four credits, two courses. So currently this year, and then in addition to that, we can look at two things. We can look at the total number of students who are enrolled in that second year class and project that they're going to finish it, or we can look at, as MS, uh, MSDE looks at it, they look at seniors only. Okay, so two different things. So if we were to look at who, students who are currently in the program at Damascus, and we take all the students who are in that class, there's 17 of them. Out of the 17, five are juniors and 12 are seniors. So we can say that we are, it's March, we're hopeful that all 17 will successfully complete the program. That's 17 students completing it. So we have 34 students in level one, we currently have 17 in level two, and out of those students, five are juniors, 12 are seniors. Now, if we were just to look at seniors only mm -hmm. for this year, we would say that 12 students are completing the program. Last year, mm -hmm. right, if we were to only look at seniors at Damascus only, mm -hmm. six students completed the programs. Okay. And those six students, we can see are probably the same students who are currently in level three class, mm -hmm. which is an optional <laughs> class. And those six students are probably um, serious about this pathway and they're taking that optional level three class, which is also earning them credit. So last year, six students completed the pathway. And so in terms of um, the TSAs, um, so how many students um, are able to get the TSA? So last year, for all of our auto programs, so I, I have the total number right now between all four schools. Mm -hmm. So last year, out of the total program, we had 32 students in our auto program who were able to earn 146 different certificates within the auto industry. Okay, thank you. Um, I do see that the and as for Seneca, one more question. So you asked if Peggy, uh, Dr. Pugh has it for me here. So currently, there are 49 students from Damascus High School who are accessing different programs at Seneca Valley. Oh, okay. That was your, okay. That was, I okay. think I wanted to make okay. sure we answered that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. So it, it looks like... Um, the program between technology one, technology two, there's a drop, 50% drop of the people. And then for the certification last year, 
to completion for seniors um, graduating is six, and this year we're projecting 12. Okay, and right now there are 49 students from Damascus are using the Seneca Valley different um, CTE programs. Thank you. You answered my questions. Thank you. I wanted to clarify, um, are you saying that we have to choose between either the traditional auto program or expanded classroom capacity at Damascus? Did I understand that correctly or not? We can't have both? No, no, no. So, so the Damascus scope does include additional capacity, as we talked about, for, for Clarksburg. Um, but, but what I'm saying is that we won't build a traditional uh, automotive space and the lab and classroom space that we proposed. Right. right, right. right. So that's the only thing. But the, you will be able to add more seats to Damascus High School in general yes. with either or Correct. either the traditional program or the lab space. Okay. That's that's one of the primary. I mean, obviously, uh, upgrading the infrastructure, but one of the primary secondary you know pieces to this project is to add capacity as part of uh, the overutilization at, at Clarksburg High School. Um, but will you be able to add as much space as you had planned originally? We, we will have to, I mean, we, we have to add those seats. And, and again, the seats, you know, there's a variety of different ways you calculate those seats, but yes, the number of classrooms that we have to add for those number of students will, will remain. Transitioning from a lab space um, that we're proposing, as Dr. Pugh mentioned, you can also take advantage of that lab space for other, other programming aspects, not just the automotive. When you go to automotive, you're, you're constructing just square footage, just space, purely for that one program. So the likelihood that we will have to add more square footage to the building because of that is, 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 is pretty, pretty, pretty likely. Just to follow up on what Carla asked, where are you gonna get the 12 million from? was a as a non-funding body we would have to ask the uh, county executive and county council to um, either shift money from other uh, other agencies um, tap into their their um, reserve funds um, or or a different approach uh, but we're we, we would just ask for the money we wouldn't necessarily you would not reduce anything that we have okay thank you miss Harris and then miss Evans uh, yeah, just uh, first is a, a clarifying question. I was a little confused about um, one thing Ms. Rivera Oven uh, mentioned about the um, auto courses at Seneca, at, excuse me, at Damascus being double period. My understanding is they're all double period. In fact, at Edison, they're a triple period. So they're not, that's not a teaching model that's different from the other programs in their locations. I, do, I don't believe. I think they're all, um, they are all required that double period. Um, but, um, a question I have, so there's been discussion at length about the proposal to build a flexible lab space that would um, could be used for a variety of purposes and that would accommodate a type of automotive program. But I think I'm understanding that we, we don't have any flesh on those bones yet. We don't, we aren't saying this is the kind of program we would create. We're saying it would give us the opportunity mm -hmm. to create some kind of program, which, I mean, that it's always good to have opportunities to create something um, new and different, although I think sometimes um, our experience doing that um, has not been smooth, and we have um, spent a lot of money and things like that on programs that are still struggling to get off the ground, like CASE at um, at. Uh, um, Sherwood and Northwood, um, but it, it sounds like there are also real-world concerns about the type of program that might be possible, because we're talking about electric vehicles. That is the wave of the future. There's going to be there is definitely a demand for people with the skill set and the certifications to do that work. But it sounds like it that might not at this point be something that is a program that could be implemented in a high school? Or, or what level of information do we have about the ability to even create a program like that? 
So if you're modernizing programs, you have to work through the state and you have to do a proposal. It would include input from our industry partners. It would include um, input from students and what their interests are. We would propose a model that probably has coursework around it. Um, a lot of times when we're trying to replicate things for high schools, we're taking from um, colleges. And so, for example, if we did an AI program, it's the courses are there and available. We just need to seek approval and how far is reasonable and feasible for high school students to, to get because um, these programs are generally stackable, right? So what's the base level credential? And then we have to work with the state to see if they approve that as either a dual enrollment course at that capstone or an industry recognized credential based upon our analysis of how far you can go in that green um, green energy course. And and I think green energy itself is, is across industries, so we might look at it as multiple industries, right? Because that's the type of skill, the base level skill that a high school student leaving, having an understanding of green energies, could enter into a variety of fields. So there would be a lot more community engagement, exploration of what's available, and building of a program um, that doesn't exist, if that's what the, the uh, community wants. It could also be, do we take the um, space that we have and look at how can we replicate what was there and do it in a different way, in a more modern way? Is it d using simulations, simulators, par parts of cars that are built into the wall? I've seen that done for um, diesel. Uh, but it, it it is modern. It is how they're training people coming into factories currently, um, and it takes up a smaller footprint. And I think we're trying to be responsible here in meeting both the educational needs and building outstanding CTE programs that honor what the students in the community are interested in. Okay, thank Hi. you. Mrs. Evans? Sure. How to go around. So thank you for the um, pictures that you provided for us earlier of the labs, the lab space and what that looks like. That was helpful to be able to get a picture of what we were talking about. I just wanted people to be clear on that. And then I'm associating myself with the comments of Ms. Wolf, and I appreciate the questions that Ms. Yang asked. And you might have answered this in the beginning. Can you talk about when we look at um, Damascus and the, and the students that are enrolled in the Technology One, and then they drop off in the second course is there a reason why do we know why there's a huge drop um, I I think I would have to get back to you uh, with the specifics as to why the drop is I don't want to speak on behalf of students um, traditionally it's been interest other classes students uh, sometimes take a course as an elective if you look at it this year for example there are two students who are seniors in that class so some of the students might be taking this course as an opportunity to learn how to change their oil how to change their tire uh, we have a lot of choices um, at every one of our high schools so sometimes for CT pathways students take courses Courses as electives. They, they take it with this mindset that they're not going to complete it because um, it's their choice. And so sometimes they'll take one or two classes or one class as an elective to learn about it. And, and a class such as this one does allow them to learn how to do those basics on a car. It would, it would be helpful to know just to make certain that the students that are entering into this area are feeling supported and have the supports that they need to, in order to stay in place to get the certification. I know a while back, probably before we had Seneca Valley, before we had the regional program, that was some of the um, discussions that we talked about at Thomas Edison, just wanting to assure that our students that went into the programs had the supports that they needed in order to stay into the end to get the certification. So just that would be helpful to know that, we take a little deeper dive into that. And, and if I can add, um, sure. you know, we're looking at a, a single program here. Historically, in Montgomery County Public Schools, the value has been placed on experiential, right? Sure. Trying a variety of things. And we're designing programs because we have to ensure students complete, right? That is the goal, that they leave us with something of value that gives them either direct entry into the workplace or direct entry into the workplace and readiness for college and the community. And so I don't think what you see here in terms of the drop-off is unique to the auto program or to any of the other programs. I think that is a common 
thing that you'll see. Um, I think our work actually is beginning with the career advising that's occurring in helping students understand their own strengths, interests, and values and where that lines up with where their potential career might be and the variety of pathways. And so we're just beginning that work, to your point, to be able to support students and maintain in the pathways, but it is going to be a shift for how our students select courses, how our counselors advise, mm -hmm. because Montgomery County has an amazing elect so many great courses, some uniquely designed by the schools um, and in a variety of areas. Um, I think as we move towards Blueprint, which is requiring the 45% of students complete an industry recognized credential, including in an apprenticeship, that it comes with a credential, we have some work to do both to um, encourage participation in a pathway that you're truly interested in, in order to learn more about entry into a career, um, and to maintain them in there. So I wouldn't want you to think that this is just one program. I think this is a systemic piece that we'll be working on. Okay. So that would be helpful to have that information. And what I do know, speaking to what you just said, is when um, I've had the ability to visit Thomas Edison, which has been several times, that you do encounter students who have the interest in going to college and they're trying to decide, for instance, if they want to take mechanical engineering or electrical. So they're using that as a hands-on experience to help them to understand. So I do know that, but that, that will help inform the board as well if we can be able to decipher who is in the classes doing what, particularly as we talk about trying to consider expanding a program in a way that may not have um, necessarily been the vision at first. But anyway, so thank you. That was helpful. Mr. Veda Oven. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, in the last three years, correct me if I'm wrong, hasn't the enrollment in, the, in both a Seneca and Damascus High School, the enrollment for the auto program have gone up? They have um, hovered around 400 students. So this year, currently, we are at uh, 402 students. Last year, we were at 408 students for all of our uh, combined out of programs. So we will be able to provide you Damascus enrollment specifically. Um, we, we will share that with you. Yeah. No, no, but my question was like in the last three years, like did we start three years ago with 400 students and now we're at 402? So we only had a, a gain of two students in three years? So we had 408 last year, and we're at 402 this year, so we had a drop-off of six students. Okay. Now, I, if you could give me the last three years, that would be helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you this. How many um, of our students in the child care program have actually completed their certification at Damascus? So that's something also that uh, we will be able to provide. We can provide you with that information. You also do horticulture? The, the other ones as well? For all of them. One that, that concerned me was the fact that you said that only two students are going now to, um, to Seneca for the hospitality program. Um, so if you could get that, that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And I also would like to know, how did you guys choose the new CT programs? How did you do the vetting? How did you come to that conclusion that those were the programs um, that would, you know, that would fit there? That would be helpful as well. And I'm still... Um, going to Mrs. Wolf's, you know, comments about how um, we're looking at, uh, you know, the future of having um, an, an, an auto mechanics, having electrical be in the future. I'm still baffled the fact that we have not requested any input from the auto industry, our, our, our local auto industry and our, our automotive uh, foundation, um, their input in this. Because again, I am not an expert, um, and I don't think a lot of my other colleagues on this on the board are on electrical, vehicle mechanical, vehicle certifications and what that will entail. But it sounds to me that this is kind of like you know when we use words like we hope that we can do this, we we think you know maybe we can you know accommodate. To me, those are not assured things as a board member. Um, that this is going to be able to happen. The last thing I want us to be in a position is that we take away the program that we know that it works, that it has worked for decades, and that then we're going to try to put something in without us, without us doing really our homework and what that looks like, that what that would entail. 
um, how much it really it will cost at the end of the day. Because I know you showed the labs that look like my, more like classrooms. And to Mr. Saeed's question about we will still be able to get cars in there, I think we just need to be honest and said, most likely not. Because the last thing I want us to do is I want is to lead the community into thinking that we might be able to do something and not be able to do it. So for me, there's still a lot of unanswered questions about this. And, um, and, but I know what has been working. I know what, you know, that, that what those kids have been completing their certification. And uh, to Mrs. Evans' question, I actually, Shevra, I asked that question of um, the teacher who, um, who that's the teaching of these students, who's with the kids every day. And he said one of the biggest barriers for the seniors is that they have the alternative to only do half a day. So a lot of them decide to actually, instead of finish the program, to get a job. And that is a big barrier for him to try to convince these kids to actually stay and finish the two years, um, the two year certificate, because they still, you know, we have that option where they, once they have everything they need, they can do half a day of schooling. So that definitely, apparently, according to him, has made uh, an impact in, in those numbers. Ms. Yang? Yes, thank oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry, did you want to respond? Yes, sorry. I believe that there was a question on how the other CT programs were selected. So we just wanted to, re to reiterate that we are just starting this process. Um, so this is as we've shared an opportunity for innovation. So no additional new CTE programs have been selected. Uh, we looked at the data from current eighth graders who are looked at the applications for other regional and countywide programs. Uh, we looked at student voice data, a very small pocket. So we're just beginning this process. And and we looked at also the current 265 students who are in other programs whose home school is Damascus. So we looked at uh, various data points, and as part of this process, we have time. We would be engaging with multiple stakeholders, with students, sharing ideas with them. I've only had an opportunity to meet with the community once, and so we're just starting this process. None of this has been finalized. This is just the beginning stage. Thank you. Ms. Yang. Yes. Um, so. Uh, CTE program is of enormous importance and interest to me personally. Uh, Brooklyn uh, has the goal that down the road, 45% of, of our high schoolers need to be industry certified or have some kind of internship apprenticeship during high school years. Now, we have a resolution that we passed in February to look at ways to engage with the business community during our procurement process so that we're waiting for the school systems plan so that our students can have more hands-on and experiential learning. So what I see is it's clear that a lot of our students are want to experience, try something first as an exploration. So I hope that will really help, like providing these opportunities for our students, right? That's their first experience. If they're serious about certification, then we also have a pathway for them to do certification. Now, I want to follow up. My question is also a continuation of Ms. Harris' question. Um, prior to joining the board, I work at Magruder High School, where we have an aviation program. And that's a program that was built over a number of years. And as I understand it, the students are completely on, um, on machines, on, on simulators, right? Oh, thank you for the word, simulators. <laughs> At first, I think the first year the program was introduced, we only have a couple simulators, right? And I think two years ago, uh, it was, well, it was a big day that a whole lab was, like we got so many new simulators, that was a day of celebration for the whole school community. And I know kids from all over the county, and I'm looking at it, there are, from Damascus, there are 18 students going to that, that program there. So what I'm trying to understand is if you say envisioning a new kind of space to do this, do we have that technology right now existing out there for automobile 
uh, industry, uh, you know, and is it feasible? You know, is it possible? I want to see the possibility to see if that's possible to build out uh, or, or, or accomplished. So it's there. It's generally not in K-12. So that's the modifications that we would have to do. Um, generally, there's a standard certification that's offered through those typical four, four courses if you're talking about automotive technology. Um, I think what you see then once you enter the industry is that they have different training models as well. And so depending on who you're working for after that base level, if you're working for Porsche, it is going to be uh, um, augmented or virtual reality. If you're working for, depending on who the dealer type is and what they're manufacturing at the time. So it will be something that would have to be created. Um, I think what it is that you're, you're talking about is we have to meet the needs of the students and the interests of the students, right? And so looking at who this serves and who it doesn't serve is really important when we're looking at programs. And I don't know the comprehensive look at what's available at each of the schools and how many students are in them, how many are, of them are, are completing them. That's a hard thing to do. Child development just changed. Uh, they have to earn an industry recognized uh, credential that didn't exist until Blueprint. And so CTE programs are always evolving and modernizing. We do need our partners and our foundation partners who are in the industries to inform us on what's next. So I respect what uh, Ms. Rivera Oven shared about moving forward in a different way. And I think, you know, where we stand today is that we want to build the best programs for what the students are interested in. Is it a combination? Is it a technology type of lab that has multiple simulations that can earn multiple um, credentials? I think what we're constrained by initially in looking at programs is it's, you know, do you build for the sake of maintaining a program or do you, do, do you build a building that meets broader needs and we adapt the programs? And I think that's really what the decision and the discussion is. And then in that decision, who are we serving? And who are we not serving through that? I wanted to um, follow up on the equity conversation in terms of you know, not replicating programs all over the county. What was the, the rationale for Gaithersburg having an auto program if Seneca was supposed to be the regional hub? I think it was before. Yeah, it was before. So, I'm sorry. Y yeah, so, so the Gaithersburg project occurred ahead of the Seneca. Um, and it wasn't until the Seneca project was under construction that uh, the discussion around creating that hub was, was generated and, okay. and implemented. Thank you for that. Um, can we talk about the CIP? Help me understand the funding. I think Ms. Wolf asked about the $12 million. Um, so the CIP is updated every two years. We, we look at the entire CIP. Um, if, if the board should decide to introduce an additional $12 million for this project this year, uh, this project is in the final years of the CIP, possibly it may or may not even make it into this current CIP. I guess what I'm struggling is, is I would like to be able to tell the community we're not going to do the traditional program, but this is what we're going to do instead. And we, I'm not hearing that we have that figured out, so it's hard to say it's going to be okay. You're going to get something good. I, I, don't, I can't say that confidently right now because we don't know what that is going to be. So um, I guess my, what I'm trying to understand is does, if we decide either way today, this can change in subsequent CIPs, correct? We could decide that we add the 12 million today and then in the next CIP review process, we decide we don't need it, let's take it off. Uh, it is an ongoing process. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, and I think sort of complicated is this project is part of the non-recommended reductions um, and, and it pushes the, part of the non-recommended reductions that pushes money even further into the out years. So um, when you push money in the out years, it basically doesn't exist until you get there. So um, I think the, the challenge uh, is that the community conversations, um, there's a desire to know which direction it's going to be, 
right? So, so those, those conversations have sort of stalled around, okay, if it's not the traditional approach, then it's almost nothing. And, and it's really been difficult to have the conversation around the what if scenarios, the, the possibilities, the, you know, the, the, um, uh, the innovation behind an approach like this. So um, I do think the community has a desire, you know, from, to know which direction we are going to head from a, from a board perspective. But you are correct, we have plenty of time. You know, there, if, if it's not decided today, it's not decided this year, um, there's the opportunity to address it in the off year of the CIP. There's an opportunity to address it on the on year. I would remind the board for Seneca Valley that decision was made late. We were under construction when the decision was made to add different uh, CTE programs at Seneca Valley, and additional funds were requested, approved, and, and we implemented them. So there's, there's always time. Um, to to add and implement, I, I, I think it's just from where we are with this particular program, there is a desire of the community to sort of just know what the direction uh, is um, moving forward. What would be the harm of adding 12 million today to the project, scope of the project, or benefit or harm? Well, I think the, the challenge is the uh, w w way I think um, the, the council, and this is just an important caveat, the council um, cannot add money to uh, the, the school board CIP. It has to be requested by the, the, the Board of Education in order for, for them to do anything. So um, I think that's one piece of, of, you know, sort of the background around should there be a request or, or shouldn't there be a request. Um, but beyond that, I think that one of the challenges that I would just I would just say is that you know in the same conversation of the Damascus twelve million dollars is that we're talking about not building auditoriums at a cost of forty five million dollars. So um, if if I think it would be a challenge to ask for twelve million dollars for for uh, an automotive program that. Uh, may not be opened until 2029, 2020, 2030, uh, when we have right in front of us a challenge with even constructing auditoriums at two of our high schools. So I think just in the grand scheme of, of the overall dollars, um, you know, we, we, we are um, trying, I guess, per, to present to the board that there are a variety of, of additional financial asks and, and we are most likely going to have to prioritize them as we move forward. Okay. Mr. Taith. Yes. <laughs> um, I know Ms. Mondrowski has a quick question that I, I want to ask on her behalf, which is, I think, um, when we make this uh, decision, like the amendment, we're not finalizing that today. That's an option we're putting on the table to finalize later in March, or it, would that be an amendment that we'd finalize today? I think that was her question. If I, I don't know. Amendment on the table, though. Yeah. Oh. If so we're not voting on anything today, right? And that was her question. I'm pretty sure. There's nothing on the table is what you I... Put your mic on. Yeah. Sorry, there's nothing currently on the table. Okay, okay, so this is just... A conversation, just a discussion now. Okay, okay I just. We just said if somebody wanted to do something, we want it to be done today because we have public hearings today yeah. and next week. So we want the public to know, be able to testify on what any decisions that we have made. It would be the introduction of an amendment today. Okay, I think. Okay, I think that'll. I th hope answer her question. Uh, and then I had a question of my own here, um, which I think is obvious, but I just want to clarify. So when, if we were to make this new program that we're suggesting at Damascus, it, it would only be available for Damascus students, correct? There would be no one who could utilize it from different schools. So I think those, those discussions obviously will be, you know, determined even as we go through the boundary study process. But, but one thing that, that, obvious, that, that, that I would like to point out um, is that as we talk about, I think we're all interested in expanding CTE programs. Mm -hmm. the, the, the idea here, too, is that an approach like this, you could possibly even re replicate at other facilities as well. It's really hard to replicate the traditional model that we have at Edison and um, Seneca Valley. A model like this, you, you do have the ability to repurpose existing space al along the way. So I think I would just 
put a plug in for that because I, I think that's been a charge that the board has asked us is to think very innovatively differently about space. How do you spread programs through, throughout the county? How do you expand some of these programs? So, um, I, you know, I, I do think that's an opportunity here as well as to, to think a little differently about how we how we go forward with it, with a space like this. Okay, so from what I'm hearing, we, we don't know whether that could be something offered to students at other schools. Because I was under the impression that if we create this, you know, new innovative program for Damascus, we wouldn't be able to have other students from other schools be able to utilize that program. It would only be available for Damascus students currently attending Damascus. That's correct, right? Do we know that? So uh, oh. we were, we are hoping to design programs for Damascus to keep Damascus students uh -huh. in Damascus. Okay. Um, you know, as all these programs grow, do you replicate them at other schools? And I think that's what Mr. Adams is trying to say. Mm -hmm. The aviation program has grown. In interest and need has grown. Mm -hmm. Is that a program we should be looking at replicating? Um, and can we do that in, in space that is more easily modernized than an entire bay with lifts? I see. Okay. I get what you're saying. I was just, because the reason I was asking you is I was actually having a concern about, like, you know, whether if it's only open for Damascus, maybe possible under-enrollment, because, I mean, you know, we've obviously heard all the testimonies of people saying they want to keep tr the traditional program, but I haven't heard anything now of people saying that they, they want this new program, and I know, you know, you talk to middle school students, but, I mean, if you asked me whether I wanted to be a biologist in middle school, I would have said yes, but it's not the career path I wanted to choose, and I think uh, I know a lot of students kind of, they branch out as they get older. I've talked to a lot of the career coaches in middle schools. They tell me the kids have, aren't even thinking about their futures yet, so I think I, have, I see no advocacy right now from you know anyone in the community saying, yes, we need this new program. So I'm worried that if we, let's say we create this and there is an interest in that specific community, that not enough people would utilize the program and it, it would be kind of a, you know, a waste almost in that case. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that the, um, you know, sort of the argument of chicken and egg, do we have the space, do we have the mm -hmm. building the way that it is, uh, or do we build programs that meet the needs of students? The survey that was done um, was actually done not for students that are currently attending Damascus, but it was done for the middle school yeah. students, right? Because yeah. that's who we're designing for. We're designing for the students who are who are coming through. So you're not going to hear advocacy for new and innovative programs from your middle school students, just to be clear. But w what they were interested in, based on our beautiful videos <laughs> and, and explanations of what the programs were, was the Project Lead the Way Engineering, which can be a multiple entry point. They were we're interested in the healthcare professions. We always need more uh, uh, clinical medical assistance, and the need is great in our community. Uh, they were interested in justice, law, and society, um, some that uh, pathway. And then there was interest in uh, a new artificial intelligence pathway, thinking about what would be a technology that would be future-oriented that we could build towards. And just want to add one more thing, though. So, so also the spaces that we're we're being asked to design are, are spaces to be flexible. Yeah. And I would take you back to the Seneca Valley picture that if you wanted to say today that we want to move away from construction trades and go to the aviation, we could do it very quickly. Um, if you were to say go to aviation in the automotive program at Seneca Valley, that's a multi-year, very expensive approach. So I think for us, too, to create these spaces that if as interest changes, as, as career technologies and pathways change, we have spaces that can adapt to it, too. So I think that's a big part of the proposal here as well. I see. That's a good point. Yeah. And if I could just add one more thing, I think there was another point that was really important in thinking about that critical piece for middle school and how middle schools serve as a linchpin. Well, something we talked about a few minutes ago was the concern with students not completing a programs countywide. So many of our programs are four credit programs, others are three credit programs. And so thinking about that students, it's very helpful if a student does know in middle school, specifically mm -hmm. in eighth grade, what their options are, right? So you're correct that a student might not not know in eighth grade that they like biology, but they should know what their feeder high school offers, mm -hmm. whether it's four credit and it, or it's three credits. Because one thing that we don't want to have is students coming into high school not knowing what regional options are, not knowing what county options are, and not even knowing what their own school options are because we have over 100 programs, 51 CT programs, not even including the mm -hmm. local programs at each high school. So I do think it's, it's only
totally fair to our students that as an eighth grader, we spend that time educating them so that they know these are my options. They might not want any of them, and in the end, they still might decide to take one as an elective and not to complete the pathway. But what we are hearing from a lot of students is the stress of finding out junior year, there's this amazing pathway, and there's no way I can do mm -hmm. it now. Or there's this pathway that had I known beginning of ninth grade, I would have taken advantage of it. So I yeah. do think with career advising, we have this incredible opportunity to start educating our middle school students so that they can ask questions, they can go to their eighth grade counselor and say, for my high school, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. What might I take? And mm -hmm. I think that's really important that we think about that. And also, Ms. rivera Oven made a really good point earlier as well, that many students are leaving halfway, halfway through the day at some of our high schools to get jobs. And again, thinking about the blueprint, that's an amazing opportunity for work-based learning opportunities and mm -hmm. experiences, right? So are we thinking about if a student is interested in a certain CTNE field, do we have an internship or an apprenticeship that they could take along with that pathway, that way they can A, learn those experiences, and then maybe even be able to make some economically smart decisions so that they have an opportunity for dual enrollment, college credit classes, industry recognized credentials that will help them manage that post-secondary pathway. So I do think it's all interconnected. And I think that, again, it's such an exciting time because we do have opportunity to engage, to discuss, and to think about what don't we have and what do we have that can be even better. Yeah. No, I, and I wasn't you know, disagreeing with that at all. I just wanted to say that, and I fully support advising our middle school students. I was just saying, you know, when you're using that as, well, a lot of them said they wanted this, that is open to change. But I fully agree with, you know, advising them of their options. I just wanted to make sure, you know, the volatility of, of the nature of volatility of being in middle school is, is acknowledged because it's definitely there. It, it absolutely is. You're correct. And so to, to add to that, the other significant data point, too, was looking at the actual application students are applying to. So we looked at the two feeder middle schools and looking at where they're applying. Mm -hmm. So there were hundreds of applications that they had submitted to high school programs. So we also looked at that data because that involved family, right? Families had conversations about these are the different programs. So we looked at that data. Data as well. Mm -hmm. And again, that was hundreds and hundreds of applications. And we were able yeah. to look at the clusters students were interested in. And then based on those clusters, we were saying perhaps we could consider the following programs. And again, we have the luxury of time to engage and to design. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Yang and then Ms. Rivetta Oven. And then we need to wrap up because we uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time. Yeah. Clarification. Right now, the Damascus program is a local program. No other students go to the automotive program. Okay, okay. So that's, um, I want to speak a little bit um, about what you mentioned just now is the MoCo CAP program, Montgomery County Career Advising Program. I actually had the pleasure yesterday to visit a middle school and actually set and observe a lively lesson um, about the RES Act. Is that, am I saying it correctly? Uh, and so it, it was sixth graders engaging in conversations about um, what is their tendency, right? Uh, what they uh, gravitate towards and then analyzing what this can be used in, in, in Korea, a way of thinking about uh, Korea interpreting the world, right? So it was, um, I, I, I have, I know we are just beginning, but I have high hope that with this collaboration and the blueprint investment that we'll get good outcome and this program will take root. Ms. Rivetta Oven. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick question um, with, uh, the, with the program. What happened uh, if you do, let's say, you know, you get rid of the program at Seneca, I mean at Damascus, and all the 60 plus kids go to Seneca. What happens when Seneca becomes a capacity? So that, again, that's something that we would also look at. Many of our CT programs have waiting lists, um, and that, that is the unfortunate uh, part of um, having highly sought out programs. So there are waiting lists for programs. And I think with Seneca Valley, again, looking at that space, it's an incredibly large space. So there would be options. Would there be an option to consider adding another teacher? For example, Thomas Edison has multiple teachers in their auto program, and they do incredible work, and the teachers are able to 
utilize this space simultaneously. Students are working on class in classrooms. Students are working in the shop. They're working with teachers, small group. It's incredible how well orchestrated it is. So that's something that Seneca Valley could explore as well. And Seneca Valley would need time. I mean, they're just a new program. They've just started. So there's so many. Again, they could follow the Thomas Edison model. It's an excellent model. Thomas Edison's program, auto program, has been around for decades, and they do a fantastic job. So again, we have a successful model in our district, and we could certainly use them as a model to expand on Seneca but Valley. But you would add more teachers to Seneca mm -hmm. Valley. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I'm guess I'm going to say that that is my fear, since this is a new program at Seneca Valley, and it is the largest school in the state of Maryland. Um, that we are right now, with the numbers that we have, and with a new program talking about you know these numbers, but looking at the whole redistricting and looking at the growth into this area, uh, that then once we make you know this decision of just have a lab at Damascus. Then we find ourselves in a, in, a, in a position in the next four to five years where Seneca is full of capacity, no longer can take kids from Damascus or Clarksburg, and we could have had an option where um, we could have that option at Damascus where, if need to be, I would think, if we had an overcapacity at Seneca, we could do the same thing that you know, we were trying to do with the kids from Damascus, bring them from Seneca to Damascus. So as we are thinking futuristic, I just want us to take into account all the ingredients that, that you know, that could happen with the growth in this industry. Um, so again, I am not convinced that we have really heard from the experts in the industry and the folks on the front lines who are teaching our kids in these programs. I would like to have and see a conversation with those folks to who can actually come and present to us some of the reasons why these are good ideas or not so good ideas, or, or maybe they are. Because at this point, it's pretty much, you know, we're just doing a lot of assumption because it is, you know, it, it is the era of technology that this is the best way to go. But I'm basing my on the on the jobs that are needed right now in the industry. And they're not so much right now in the, you know, um, in one way or the other, but they are in the traditional uh, mechanics that it is the biggest deficit. So when we are making these decisions, I want to see also the whole workforce development numbers. You know, are we meeting the needs right now? Is that what is going to be in the next five years, in the next 10 years? And I think that is important because I think we want to give our kids a plethora of, of different um, experiences that they can actually be, be able to make a living out of. So I just think that um, that is an area that I still am not feeling too comfortable because I really, I just have heard so many just kind of assumptions that this is the best thing, but I really don't, do not see a very clear path of how that was a right to. Thank you. Ms. Wolf. I just want to respond that we make our decisions through an equity lens, and I believe there's an equity statement regarding everything we do. So I, I just want us to keep that in mind, because as I said before, there are already three programs up county in automotive, and we created a regional center to address this issue, both up county and down county. So it's starting to seem to me that we are not focused on providing the same resources all over the county. Okay? That's it. Okay. Um, seeing no other lights on, um, Ms. Rivetta Oven, your hand is up. I think you just, you just uh, said your last words. Um, yes, when uh, uh, President uh, Sylvester, when you're ready, I would like to make an amendment to the CIP. Go ahead. Um, I would like to move to increase the Damascus project by 12 million to include, include the construction of a traditional automotive space for career and technology program. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Ms. Yes, Ms. there was one more slide that was Poolsville. Did we need to finish or no? Are we done? I mean, do we need? We can do this and then go. Okay.
I can I can hold. No, go ahead. So oh, uh, sorry. I can I can redo it again. Would you like me to restate it again? Please. Okay, I move to increase the Damascus project by twelve million to include the construction of a traditional automotive space for career technology program. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, raise your hands. Against, raise your hands. Okay, and the motion does not pass. Thank you. Mr. Adams. If we could pull the slides back up. If we could pull the slides back up. Um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, President Board, uh, so much I, I didn't know who voted against and forth. Can, can I please have a call of who voted against and for it? Um, Mr. Saeed voted in favor. Mrs. Evans voted against. Mrs. Harris voted against. I voted against. Mrs. Wolf and Ms. Yang voted against. Ms. Uh, Rebecca Smodrowski is not here. Okay, thank you. Okay, the, uh, the last slide um, is the Poolsville High School major capital project. Um, and, and we wanted to bring this one to the table. Uh, the original completion date for the entire project, again, this was another phase one, phase two project. The entire project was set for this summer. Um, unfortunately, due to a lot of the start and stops that we've, we've encountered over this particular project, uh, we have been delayed. I, I think we've presented that to the, the board over time, but I, we wanted to make sure that we brought this to uh, just a discussion purposes. Um, we are scheduled to move into phase one over spring break of this year. Um, we are going to wait to start phase two until this summer, and the, the anticipated completion of the entire project will be the next summer, August of 2025. So it will basically be a year from what the CIP stated a few years ago around the completion date. So we just wanted to bring that one forward, but also just again to highlight the, the, the really good community work that's been happening. We have uh, the school construction team um, that's, that's meeting regularly. We, we have um, engaged with a group to, to revisit how and what materials go into our, our buildings around renovations. And obviously that's translating to some positive things on, on other projects as well. Um, so when we look at projects like Silver Spring International Middle School, it's underway. You know, a lot of the, the same um, approaches to what we've learned through Poolsville are being applied to there, and we're navigating, you know, those schedules and those, those processes as well. But just wanted to bring this one to your attention, and we will certainly update at a future board meeting through a change order around the completion, but, but wanted to raise that to your attention. And so with that, I think go to the next slide, and it's open to discussion. Just I just have a quick question yes. about, I don't want to, you know, keep us for too much longer, but, you know, when I see the construction report, I see like, you know, 80 some percent complete and all that. And, you know, I've heard from Poolsville students, it's, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly w what part of that new building is actually complete. Like, how far are we? I know you said the f final completion date is later. What is actually, you know, there right now? Do we have an interior built? You know, what does it look like? Sure. If we could actually go back to that slide, um, the, uh, the, the portion um, to the right, is a brand new academic space. So when the students move in over spring break, it will be an entirely new, um, if we go back one slide, a new academic wing of the building. We will have uh, the new space or the, the renovated space over by the administration. So what you're seeing there is as, as you go from the left side of the screen to the right, what's in the center is the, the previous science wing that was that science annex. Everything towards the back, towards the field, is all brand new academic spaces that we will transition students into over spring break. So it's gonna be a really neat experience. And then the phase two is going to be things like constructing the new gym, um, renovating uh, auditorium space, and, and demolition of, of older classroom space. So uh, it's gonna be exciting this spring break for, for students to move into some of the, the new 21st century learning classrooms. Yeah, that is exciting. And, you know, I'd love to, you know, have a tour of that too. I think that'd be really, really cool because I remember seeing that in my last year's school visit when it was just like, um, you know, uh, wood and just like metal everywhere and you could see people wielding stuff. So I'd love to, to take a tour there sometime. So maybe we can schedule that in the books. Ms. Harris? Yeah, uh, just along those lines, I'm just, um, so you're moving in over spring break. That's, that's a tight timeline to get everything moved in. Um, and so the, 
what we see on the slide on the right side going back to the athletic field with the old with the prior science wing in the foreground all of that is going to be occupied after spring break right. that's correct wow um okay and Fantastic. yeah because I, I was i i did a shatter day at poolsville back in october and that that that's amazing that's amazing progress um and so um, what part of the building is going to be vacated? Because you said n then we're going to move on to, you know, I know that the auditorium currently has just been completely just blocked off this entire academic year. Um, and you said there's going to be some demolition of some old classroom spaces. So what, uh, what we're looking at here on this slide, where is your work going to transition to after spring break? Sure. So it might be hard to see, but the, uh, the the white roof that you see is all the brand new space mm -hmm. um, and yeah. renovated space. Uh, the darker gray that's in the background is going to be parts of the, the renovation or full demolition. So okay. we'll, we'll basically go back on the back side of the building sure. and, and start that work of, of ren renovation and, and demolition. And that starts immediately after spring break? Or? No, that will start this summer. This summer. We'll, we will have a pause of, slight pause. We'll still be obviously out there working, but it, it won't be as um, intensive as, as it will be this summer when we start that demolition and, and abatement work. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I echo Mr. Saeed. I would love to <laughs> yeah. have a tour. Mrs. Evans? Yes, um, so I'm glad that you mentioned what was in phase two. And um, although it's going to be a year away, I know that they'll be happy to know that they're getting their gym, right? I've been in their gym, so I'm glad we were able to incorporate that. So I just wanted to mention that. It's long overdue. Thank you. Okay. I can't see Ms. Rivetta Oven. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments, then uh, thank you so much for the presentation and board members for the discussion. We have difficult decisions to make, and so I think um, we will continue to hear about the Damascus project. And like I said, this, uh, this is a long iterative process, so uh, to be continued. Thank you so much. We are adjourned. Thank you.